Welcome to the Bullcaster Podcast, episode 33. We've got a special guest today, pretty stoked on this one, uh, Dirk. we got Rocky Moran Jr. with us. Uh, Going to get him on in a little bit, and the last name kind of says it all, right? Moran Speedway, yeah, so many sure. people know about that place. When I got here, it was like, have you ever been to Moran? Did you get a chance to go to Moran? Like, that was the track, right? Yeah. I'm like, no, I'm at Cow Speed, damn it. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, I'm stoked to, to, to get with him, get chatting with him about not just the track, but his karting career and I know you got a chance to play in the cars a little bit, so well, why don't we get through these current events real quick so we can get him on, Dirk? Yeah. We had Tracy round the hell is it? Five. Round, round five. Round yeah, five, I think yeah, we're recording this on June seventh. So we just a, yeah, we just started the halfway point of of our season. For yeah, that. June seventh we're recording. We're not going to have this guy out until July sixth, so another month. We're actually getting ahead of the game, mm -hmm. like we're responsible or something like that. <laughs> Trying to be. Yeah, but we got uh, the fifth that just uh, the fifth round that just happened. And this comes out, we'll have just done the sixth. They'll be on a couple of episodes from now. How'd it go for you? I know that it was a bit of a up and down day. I'm still doing the test and tune thing, so we'll get to that in a sec. But you're yeah. in a championship hunt. Yeah, I mean, I felt pretty good in quality. Uh, uh, came out fourth, and it was pretty tight between the top four or five of us. And then uh was able to make up some ground right away on the first lap in the uh, the opening lap of the first heat, excuse me. And then uh, had a little bit of contact as we came up the hill. and a little schmazzle. Yeah, I fell back to eighth or so or fell back to 11th in it finishing eighth and then from there it was just trying to dig myself out a whole the rest of the day and i don't think i had anything for a win but maybe you know podium but it was it was pretty close and uh was trying to make up some ground in the uh the main and try to move up to fifth and uh overshot silk a little bit and we're going backwards so we're going in pretty hot there overshot silk had to back out of it pretty good, and then that was kind of – I was just on an island by myself for the rest of the race. And, yeah, it's kind of what it looked like, you know, yeah. watching your races that you were a little bit further back. Didn't really have anything for the for the front group as they were battling out, but at the end of the day, it's still a decent points day. Decent day, but – With, with, uh, with missing the round, it with, is your worst, and you yeah. keep it. So, I mean, with uh, with the way Lampy and uh, Gutierrez are driving, at decent doesn't cut it right now so i got to figure it out for right. the rest of the year yeah you were on a string you had a podium in the opening round but we had joked about it, it was a bunch of fourths in a row yeah yeah this is a fifth we went the wrong direction in the numbers yeah <laughs> i was hoping for a penalty so i could get back on the fourth nice. <laughs> so, you, so you got a third you got a fourth a few fourths and a fifth you can only get what second and first now right I guess yeah well hopefully it goes back up yeah <laughs> to finish Jeez. the numbers out i'm getting every other spot right now oh man so uh, yeah so you're you're going for the championship deal i'm still just Testing and tuning, right? Yeah, Playing I saw around. you uh, throwing a bunch of different stuff at your setup this last weekend. Yeah, running the VLR and the uh, the hundred CC deal. Well, only one doing that. Well, I know Brian Phillipson was out here, uh, and he oh, was yeah. he was rolling the VLR. Obviously, we're trying to get ready for the Rock Vegas race, uh, so that's where our focus is, and just trying to like figure what this engine package likes. Does it like a lot of teeth? Does it not like a lot of teeth? Does it like to be rebuilt more often? Right. I don't know. Uh, and I was actually flying solo this time. Um, my my guy, Jim Jim Barry, was over there playing around with Quincy in the park. Uh, yeah. Being, don't know what was going on over there, but <laughs> he curious. wanted to go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, he got a chance to go, do some cool stuff. Looking forward to hearing how uh, that went from him. But uh, having to, to, uh, to turn the wrenches and turn the steering wheel this weekend's I don't relish it. I, yeah. I'm so you really appreciate it. It was a lot <laughs> easier when we were doing here. that and doing 206. Yeah. Yeah. Because we <laughs> there was no wrenches. You just, yeah, you check the pressure, <laughs> make sure you're good. Worst thing was, I was doing two classes. I had to take the weight on and off. That oh, was it. yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah. So for me, it was just uh, playing around. I ended up getting second. Got a chance to dice it up with uh, uh, Brett Harrelson a little bit there at the yeah. end. Uh, I had won the last two, and he got me on this one. And I, you know, it was okay. It was like his birthday weekend and whatnot. So oh, okay. We, we let him have that. That's one. why he had the posse out here then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, P two for us. Uh, but learned some more stuff, so I'm kind of looking forward to see what happens. I know the next one should be a barn burner. We've got some hitters coming out for uh, for that race because they're getting ready for the Cal Speed Summer Shootout. Yeah, that's I already gonna be know Maddie J is going to be out there. I haven't got a chance to race with Johnson in a while, so I'm stoked. Hopefully, Ty Mata shows back up. Again. Oh yeah, yeah, that, Dude, was, that awesome. was awesome racing yeah. with him again. So, but uh, yeah, that's that's enough for for uh, the current events, I think, and uh, what we just got done doing. We'll yeah. move on to the next thing, and well, the next thing is our guest today, and uh, well, we'll start blabbing and go <laughs> Rocky Moran. So, Rocky, come on over. Let's get you on, bud. Rocky, thanks for coming on board, brother. 
Of course, guys. Thank you for having me. Man, it, uh, it's it's awesome to get someone like you on that's been in the sport for so long. You know, part of the other, you know, obviously Moran. Uh, I said Speedway. I think it was a Moran Raceway. Moran, Moran Raceway. Raceway. Exactly. Uh, and we'll, we'll get to that in a, in a bit. But obviously, it's a it's a Monday. You're you know taking a slice out of your day to make this happen. And, and what is it that you do on a nine to five? So when we closed Moran Raceway, it was the end of December 2007. I had to figure out what I was going to do. I decided to get into commercial real estate. I went to work for a company called Lean Associates, hung my license there, and basically decided to sell and lease industrial warehouses. So these uh, these big warehouses that you see all around the track, that's like my bread and butter. Gotcha. Uh, the uh, Inland Empire is my backyard. So I lease these. I sell these. I represent tenants and landlords that are in these buildings, and I've been doing that since essentially about May of 2008 is when I started. And how old were you at that time, and, and why did you decide to, to do that? Like, What was the drive? Well, I was 28 at the time. Um, it was basically out of necessity. I was married. I had kids. We were going into a recession. Uh, my little dream business that my dad and I had had just closed. And I was at that crossroads where, of course, I always wanted to be a paid professional race car driver. That was option one. <laughs> but um, but it, that wasn't working out. And I, you know, I, I, I had long known that it's a pay to play sport, right? right? And I didn't have deep enough pockets to just go buy myself an IndyCar ride and live out my fantasy. So I had to go get a real job. And, um, and my dad had been in development for decades. My grandfather had been in development for decades. So they were well connected with brokers out here. Okay. They knew my personality. They knew my, my disposition. They had been dragging me kind of into some of their real estate deals. And I was reluctantly going and I'm like, this is just boring and terrible. And I just, all I want to be is an IndyCar driver. Why am I here? Right. But it ended up turning out great. It ended up being a great vocation for me long term. And I'm super happy. Well, nice. yeah. I mean, now you've been doing it for, let's see, carry the one, uh, 12, 13, 13 years. years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right in exactly. there. Exactly. So it must not be going too bad for you at that point. No. And it actually allows me, it's a flexible job. I'm my own boss. I'm a 1099 guy. Um, I'm able to make good money doing it. So it allows me to carry on our racing program, at least for junior, for Rocky junior. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so we're having a lot of fun with him and, and definitely I could get in and do it. If I got myself in shape, I could go do some racing as well. Right. But now I'm just striking a balance between, you know, I can only get away from work so much. I gotta, right. I gotta pick and choose, you yeah. know, and uh, how much I, time and money I spend doing it. Exactly. <laughs> and I'd assume that the, the, the leaning definitely goes towards the munchkin at that point. Absolutely. Yeah. It's all about him now. hundred <laughs> percent. <laughs> well, speaking of Munchkin, let's go back to the early days uh, yeah. when you when you were that Munchkin. How did you? I, I honestly, it, it, my bad. I don't know much about the Moran family at all. Not even being from this area or anything, so I didn't get a chance to drive on yes. uh, the Moran Raceway. But as a kid, how did you get into it? Did did your dad race and and so on and so forth? Yeah. So my dad loved racing. He, I think, my dad loves racing more than anyone I've ever met. He's just a hundred percent all in, the ultimate racer. So. He got a go-kart at five years old. His dad, you know, was a fun guy, allowed him to have various toys, motorcycles, dirt bikes, uh, you know, ATVs, all the stuff that existed back then. And go-karts were essentially invented in Azusa in the 50s. I'm probably screwing that up to some fine detail, but <laughs> but ultimately the birth of karting was here in Southern California right, right, about yeah. the time. And my dad was born in 1950s. So when he was a little guy, he was one of the first guys to ever even drive a go-kart, you know, wow, a real go-kart. Awesome. So he got into it, um, ended up racing. Uh, I think his first race was at Adams in the 60s nice. and uh, just was all in. And, and his dad supported his racing. So he ended up racing cars oh, wow. uh, in his teenage years and into his 20s. And he always had the goal of being an IndyCar driver. He got his first shot in an IndyCar race when he was 30 years old at Watkins Glen for Dan Gurney's All-American Racers. Oh, nice. Ended wow. up passing the field, leading, uh, leading the race, and ran out of gas with two laps to go in his first IndyCar race. Oh, so man. he would have been one of the only people ever in, in, a, in a, his first IndyCar race to actually win it. Wow. Um, so uh, you know, he had an in interesting up and down career, uh, spent most of his 30s not racing as much as he would have liked to, ended up getting another opportunity to do uh, some sports car racing for Dan Gurney's All-American Racers. Ended up um, running a lot of sports car stuff, actually being a paid real race car driver. That's awesome. By Toyota into his early 40s. 
Um, ended up winning the 24 Hours of Daytona, and he also raced in the Indy 500 um, in, I think, 88, 89, and maybe 91. I need to go back and check that, but three years, he raced in the Indy 500. So he got a chance to achieve the dream. Yeah, yeah, and so I grew up really in a racing family because I was born in 80, so okay. you know, when I was 8, 9, and 11, I was going back to the Speedway with him oh, and man. got to be in the parade and got to meet oh, all the drivers, wow. and so... <laughs> so whether you the, like it or not... <laughs> Yeah, I was in. Yeah, yeah, no matter what. Like I would have had to I would have had to be a very odd kid not to have turned out to be a race car driver because <laughs> yeah. he was just throwing it at me yeah. at a young yeah, age. Immersed. Yeah. Immersed. Yeah. Wow. So I had the ultimate racer dad and um and so he put me in a go kart at he put me on a three wheeler at two years old. So that was the first vehicle I ever rode was a three wheeler. I tipped over burnt my neck. I've got this awesome muffler burn on my neck that I, I sport to this day. Um, and then I was in a go-kart at about four, a yard cart, you know, like a little just recreational four-stroke yard cart. That, that's what uh, Rob Nile started on, was a yeah. yard cart. Yeah. yeah. And the thing handled awesome. Like it, it had like constant oversteer. It was like a drifter. Yeah. So he would let me rip in the backyard and we had like a circle track and I would go around a tree and, um, and it was, I, I actually remember driving and it was awesome. And then he got me my first go-kart when I was seven, my first real go-kart. It was a bug go-kart with a Briggs & Stratton four-stroke on it. Went out, did some testing at Adams. And prior to that, he had actually allowed me to drive Adams when I was like four or five years old in the yard cart. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. Totally unregulated, total Wild West. Some guy in a KT mowed me down at the end of the straightaway. Uh, I probably swerved into him. It was probably 100% my fault. <laughs> but um, I remember him just smashing me, and I ended up flipping into the Oleanders Holy when I was like four balls. or five years old. So I'm like, man... I don't like being on the track with like faster cars. I, that that was like the first memory in my head is like I yeah. can't I can't be out here with these guys because I can I can hear them coming but I can't see them coming. Yeah. Well, no, no, and, I was thinking about it, the first time so he gets on a three wheeler, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Flips yeah. Birds, like, gets on a go kart, gets Flips. mowed down. It's like this is not working out so good for Junior. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. I probably would have raced sooner than ten. I didn't get to my first race till I was ten. But uh, but I think because there was a little bit of trauma there, I just like to go out and practice yeah. and, just, and just drive around and get comfortable. And then I got to a certain age at 10 years old where I entered my first race, finished fourth. It was at Adams, 1990. What, what were they doing? In, it was it for 10, that would be cadets now. But it wasn't a great question. cadets. Is it juniors? So, or? so cadets actually didn't exist back then. Right. We right. ran on full size carts. I think the tires, I think the rear tires were a little smaller. And, you know, you had to mount the seat way up mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, have the pedal platform and, and all that. But we ran on, on full size carts with just, um, you know, that if you remember the Comer motors, mm -hmm. that was basically the motor, okay. the Comer ADCC two stroke motor. That was the premier motor when I got into junior one karting. Gotcha. And there really was there were no kid carts. So you didn't yeah. see, there were no five and six year olds racing carts back then. Mm -hmm. right. If you were racing carts at eight or nine, you were considered young. ridiculously young yeah, at that right. point. In 94 in Pats, I, I've told it before on the show, but uh, it's, I was 12 and I was one of the youngest kids in 94 mm -hmm. in Pats. I mean, obviously much bigger down yes. here, but yes. there was no, like at that time that we had a little bit of a shorter wheelbase, one of the earlier quote cadet carts, cause they just changed the rules on the, on the wheelbase. But yep. yeah, you were running full size stuff. And to your point in a bug, who are you racing there when you, when you first get going in right around 90? Yeah. So when I got in, in 1990, there were probably 10 or 12 kids racing and it was Tri-C and it was SoCal Sprinters. Those were the clubs that were at Adams. Those were like the clubs that everyone would race. And yeah. then we had IKF Region 7, which at the time, some of my best memories of racing were IKF Region 7. There was no SCUSA. There was no STARS. There was no ROTAX. That, that was so the organization to that, go race Yeah, at. IKF Region 7 was it, you know? Mm -hmm. And and when you went and won a Duffy, if you travel around the country and you and you won a Duffy, that was basically winning the Supernats. You know, that was the biggest yeah. race you could possibly win. And there were 300 to 500 entries in those fields. Awesome. And, you know, people from all over the country that would come. And some Canadians would come down. So... It was really serious racing. A lot of, you know, really good race car drivers, some that made it, some that didn't, uh, came out of that era. So, you know, when I was racing, um, you know, I was racing against John Antonino, Austin Cameron, Johnny Borneman, Augie Vidovich, uh, James Brancati, who I race with now. His son races with my son. Um, a lot of our sons race against each other now. The anti um, was in that group. Exactly, exactly. Um, and I'm probably a million people I'm forgetting. I mean, I mean Tyler Walker, Ben Walker, um, a kid. The kid that I had to beat when I first got there was a kid named Chris Thunstrom, 
And he, uh, he was basically the number one junior kid in the country. And he happened to race at Adams and he was just ridiculously fast. And <laughs> he also had a better motor and a better cart and he was a better driver. So I had no upside, you know, I got yeah, in right. and, and more experience. He was like going to travel, <laughs> traveling to national events and stuff. So I remember, um, I remember Chris Freckleton's dad, uh, Jerry Freckleton leaning down into my cart when I was like 10, he's like, that's the kid you got to go. You got to go chase that kid. You got to do exactly what he does. So, um, you know, I pretty quickly, it, 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 it was somewhere between six months to a year before I won my first race, but we got off of the bug cause that wasn't the right cart. And we got off of the motor. We were running a Walt Myers motor and we got, we got a Fleming motor, a Doug Fleming motor. Oh, neat. We got on a Dino 190 cart and all of a sudden I could, I could run with these guys. Okay. And then at that point it was just race craft. It was learning race craft and right, figuring right, out right. how to you win a race. You picked up the, uh, the driving though pretty quick though, it seems like. Yeah. Yeah, that part that part came pretty easily. I remember like the first time I led a race coming out of the sandbox and going down to the Little Monza and being like, oh my gosh, I'm leading a race. Like, yeah. the, like you have the weight of the world on your shoulders, the responsibility. Yeah. You're like, I can't believe I'm the leader of the pack. There's you know? no one in front of me. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, got, I got to put this all together, you know? Um, and then started doing traveling around doing IKF Region 7 races and uh, got, got much better, developed my driving. And um, ended up winning ICAF Region Seven Championships. Won a couple Duffies. It, um, how, how early did that happen? Like, so well, you start in '90, and yeah. you're like, "Holy shnikes!" And then you guys, how quickly do you guys get the better equipment and start traveling and doing those things? Yeah, I would say we raced club racing for uh, about a year, maybe nine or ten months. Uh, my dad. He had a yellow notepad, and after every weekend, he'd actually write down, you know, my lap times, where I started, where I finished. So we had kind of like a little diary of the weekend. Sure. And he told me, he's like, one day I'm going to give it all to you. He's like, you're going to love it. So he, <laughs> he wrote down the notes on every race, who I raced against, all that stuff. Um, so I, it's a little gray at this point, but somewhere around a year, I think it started getting yeah. more serious. And I moved up to the next class, you know, the junior two class, which would be like K junior now okay. and it got more serious and there were deeper fields i was racing against phil giebler pat long right um uh paul edwards and at the time uh, really these good are drivers. Just drivers michael valiente they, but it turns out oh, that wow. it ends up being a deep ass field of driving. a ridiculous field i mean guys <laughs> that literally went on to be indy car yeah, drivers exactly and, you know was there a, um, a big push from your dad or was it mutual that you both wanted to keep moving up yeah he was definitely definitely the catalyst like i don't think i ever would have gotten introduced to the sport uh, you know, it's a, it's a niche sport, right? It's a yeah, unique right. sport. It's right. expensive. It's dangerous. It's complex. It's not like most stick and ball sports. So right. if you don't know someone that gets you into it, if you don't have someone to, to kind of lead you there, Got I think you, there's yeah. very few people that just find it on their own. Sure. You know, my sure. dad, my dad was kind of one of those guys, but, but for me, he was definitely the driving force, but I also loved it. And, and he, he, because he was a racer and he had done so much, he understood the challenges of it. He understood how hard it was to put together consistent laps, to win a race, to lead a race. He knew how hard it was. So he, he really was never the, like the little league crazy dad that was hard on me. He was always supportive and fun and wanted me to do well. And was the driver coach was the mechanic. He financed the whole thing, you know, made it happen for me. Right. So it's I was like, lucky. This is my retirement plan. right? Yeah, here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> he, he got very close. It almost worked out, yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, but, um, but you know, ended up winning a couple Duffies in '93 at Batavia, New York, and won another one. Didn't yeah. take long. No, exactly. I only did karting full time for four years. Oh, uh, no yeah, way. four and a half years, wow. '90 through '94. So from the time I was ten to you know just after eighth grade, I was karting full time. That's all I did. And then, um, you know, my dad was ahead of the game with starting everything young with me. That's why I was on a three wheeler at two years old and a go kart sure. at four. Before that was trendy. Before that was cool. <laughs> he was like the guy that was doing that, and so. Um, he had me in a race car at 14. I remember getting called out of my English class in eighth grade to go drive a Formula Ford at Sonoma wow. at the Skip Barber Racing School. And correct me if I'm wrong, that was far from normal. That was ridiculous. Like, yeah. I had to go to the courthouse and sign, say, an eman- sign right. like an emancipation letter. And, um, and you know, people, people thought that he was crazy, but he's like, this is fine. Like he can do it, you know, like he's safe. He's got a good head on his shoulders. He's not going to kill himself. He's fast. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so went and did that and then ended up doing that like, was at Laguna. That was at Sonoma back in the day. Oh, my Sonoma. first, yeah, gotcha. my first, okay. my first, uh, actual car racing school that I went through and we wanted to do some racing. I think they, I think Skip Barber shot it down and said, no, you're too young. You can't have a 14 year old racing cars back then. It was just absurd. Yeah. And then, uh, I think you had to be 18. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. was, he was he somehow, they were letting me in and, and bending the rules. Well, and emancipation. Now you're an adult. Yeah, basically. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Might not be able to vote, but whatever. yes. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And so, um, I ended up doing 
a full year of car racing at the Jim Russell Racing School. Oh, um, they utilized Pro Mazda cars that were slightly detuned, and it was spec arrive and drive. So you would show up, and you would drive these Mazda cars at Laguna Seca for a full year. So that's actually where I learned to drive race cars at Laguna. It ended up being my favorite favorite track. I ended up winning my first Atlantic race there. So it was really good that I cut my teeth at Laguna because it's just such a good place. How did uh, How did that first day at Sonoma go? Uh, it was a three day racing school. It ended up raining on one of the days. Oh, jeez. Um, I've been hearing this yeah. happens a lot in these stories. That this, yes. Skip it, turns around. He's like, the one time I let a 14 year old Exactly. In, you know? <laughs> exactly. And, and how much rain driving had you done in the carts? Very little. I was going to yeah. say. Like maybe one or two races. Yeah. He's like driving to and from the track. <laughs> that yeah. was it. Yeah. Back in the day in SoCal and IKF, when it would rain, it wasn't uncommon for them to call it off. Like mm. it wasn't like it is now where everyone just breaks out all the rain gear and the right. rain tires and we're like ready to go. Well, and that, and naive question, I have no idea. But was there rain tires back then? For, there, there for were, there were, because I remember running rain races. Okay. But it just wasn't there. I, I just don't think people were as prepared. It was the rain races just weren't as common. Yeah, and, and right. as they are now, the tracks didn't drain properly. There'd be like lakes on the on the track. Yeah, it's basically you know? cow speed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. It, yeah, so it was just a different era. But um, the karting was awesome because it prepared me for car racing. It taught me everything about starts and drafting and all the and fundamentals all, of it, all the fundamentals, they all carried over. So I've always believed if you are really good in a cart, if you're talented, if you're experienced, if you've won at the highest levels of karting, there's a, an extremely high chance you're going to go to cars and do well. There are new things to learn. You've got to learn, you know, the brakes are different. The arrow is different. Yeah. Uh, the weight, the weight of the car and the mass of the car is completely different. So, um, you know, there's a lot to learn, but that transition usually goes pretty well for the kids that are fast in carts. Almost all of them do really well in cars sooner yeah. or later. So you're so. you're getting a chance to do this thing at 14. Yep. And you got mixed conditions. You get a little bit of wet, a little bit of dry. How, to, to Derek's point, how does that yeah. whole weekend go? I think it went really well overall. I didn't stuff the car. There was no big accidents. I was fairly quick. You've already um, won then. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was, it was, it was great. I mean, it was just a three day racing school. It wasn't. It, I never ended up racing or qualifying yeah. or anything like that. I think the last day was an open lapping day, and that was the day that it rained. But it was, it was a total success, and I kind of passed that test. And then my dad was like, "Okay, you know, we've done what we need to. We've accomplished what we want to do in karting." Let's go to the next level. Let's go run this Jim Russell Racing School series, which is this arrive and drive series at Laguna Seca. You're in pretty fast cars. And I did that for a full year. Didn't win a race. Uh, but there were other guys from karting that had moved up into that series. Like Casey, Casey Mears was there. Um, Shan Groff was there. Um, you know, guys from karting had gone through that as kind of like a ladder to try to move their way up, you right. know, the racing world. So ended up getting the fastest race lap and podiums and, and leading races. and was very close to winning races there. Had the speed, just didn't put it together. It was like eight races. And I got quick towards the end of the season and finally figured out how to drive a car. And back then the cars were H patterns. You actually had to like use the clutch. You yeah. had to do, you had to blip the throttle. Be aware of your it rev was, matching. Yeah. yeah so that, that, that was my problem is like, I'm like, I'm fast in a go kart. I just want like a steering wheel and a throttle and a right, pedal. And right. now you're putting me in this thing where I gotta. There's a lot to there, learn. There's all this other crap. And and <laughs> and the newer race cars now, they're paddle shift. They're they're much easier mm -hmm. from that perspective. You don't have sure. to learn all the shifting and the blipping. A lot of them have a lot of user friendly blipping. on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's more like a go kart. The, yeah. the modern day race cars are more like a go kart. The old ones weren't. So had to get through that. That was my biggest drawback. But once I figured that out, the speed was there. And then. Um, senior threw me in the Barber Dodge Pro Series, which was like two levels below IndyCar. And that was kind of the feeder series into Indy Lights or Toyota oh, Atlantic. Right. And I did three and a half seasons in that series. Oh, And that series traveled with uh, IndyCar for the most part. It also followed some sports car races. But uh, Skip Barber, um, it was his premier series. He had a contract with Dodge. He had 30 spec race cars. They had about 260 horsepower motors in them. Um, spec car, spec tire, spec wings. And again, it was arrive and drive. Right. So highlight the driver. That was the goal. That was the goal. You're never going to get 30 equal race cars. There were, right. some, there were some holes in the game, but they did a good job overall. And they had kind of a traveling circus of mechanics and trucks. And they would go around the country to these races and the races were televised on ESPN. And back then to, to enter one of those races, I think was somewhere between eight to 10 grand a weekend. Wow. And you're, you're at a 
premier event. You yeah. know, you're being noticed. You're with you know, the big by, show. Yeah, you're being noticed by indie indie light team owners, indie car team owners. You're written up in Racer Magazine. It was definitely oh, cool. <laughs> bang for the buck. You couldn't get a better deal. Yeah, I mean, was, I think it costs eight grand to do the Super Nats now, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah <that's>, right. So <laughs> the, the obvious ladder forward was to to do this series. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Out of 100%. curiosity, you said you did about three and a half or so years of that. Yeah. What was the was age part of that, or like did you have to check boxes, or was it just that was when you got the next opportunity? We were really trying to stay there um, until the next opportunity presented itself, and t- and also until I was winning races there. Uh-huh. So um, you know, don't move that you was up too the, quick. That was the goal. Yeah, and I was young. I mean, I was racing back then. I was racing against a bunch of guys that were in their mid twenties and thirties. And I was like this 16 year old kid. I was leaving, you know, geometry class sophomore year to fly to Detroit to race 25 year old dudes from around the world, you know? So it was a totally, uh, it was just like everyone in the pit lane uh, appreciated it. Like they were half scratching their heads, like what's going on here? Like uh, how, how could his dad let him actually do this? But I was fast and I was, I was like fighting for podiums and setting fast race slaps and wasn't dangerous, you know, uh, in the, so in those early years of the formula car stuff, was there any looking back now, is there anything you would have tried to do different as far as maybe take an extra year yep. in one of those series or anything like that? Well, that was really the only thing we could do then. I actually stayed there longer than most people. I'd been there for a long time going mm-hmm. into my fourth season. Most surprised people don't, me. Yeah, yeah, most yeah. people don't stay in the same series that long. So um, it was good. It was great for me because I was developing about halfway through um, that process, they went to a new car, an updated car, because the cars we started driving initially were steel tube, kind of old school chassis. Yeah. Um, and they updated to full carbon fiber, sequential shift, uh, more modern cars that were built by Renard. And when that new car came out, um, the equality of, of the prep in the series got a lot better. What year and is this around? That was 1998. Okay. Yeah, 1998. And so I raced in 98 and 99. And then in 99, when I was 19, I won the first race from the pole, won the second race from the pole. Um, third race, I was on the pole and had a 10 second lead and blew a tire out with like a lap to go. Um, but basically was leading the championship, always in the top three, super fast. You know, I, I definitely earned my wings to go to the next level. Mm-hmm. And a, and a, um, a wealthy Microsoft uh, engineer that had originally done some racing with us back in 1995 at the Jim Russell Racing School he decided to sponsor me to kind of um, step aside. He was racing Toyota Atlantic and to put me in a car uh, with P1 Racing, which was a local Toyota Atlantic team in San Clemente. Oh, cool. And so I got my shot to go race Atlantic and I ended up in Atlantic for the next three and a half years. So uh, it was great, you know, and I actually missed karting at the time. Like I, I always had the greatest memories of karting and what I liked about karting was that it was way less political. You could control your own destiny. You yeah. could buy your own car. You could buy your own motor. Obviously, it was more affordable to do. Um, but you're not at the whim of all these other elements. Yeah, once I, it, it took me a few years to actually figure out what the heck was going on. But probably by the time I was 17 or 18, it had fully dawned on me that if you're not with the right team, it's over, you know, and if you're a type A super competitive guy that's used to winning, I think I, I won like 35% of the go-kart races I entered over four years. So when you get to a place where you're winning 0% of the, of the car race, yeah, you're right. like, what's going on here? Like, what, what is it me? Is it the car? And at first I, I thought it was me and, and it was to a certain extent, like I was, I was fast, but I wasn't always consistent and I didn't, I wasn't fully equipped to tune the car to me, to get the arrow right, to get the shocks right, to get the bars gotcha. right. Once I figured that out, yeah, I started winning races. That that all came. But um, by the time you go to Toyota Atlantic, there's a lot of disparity in the teams. It's They're basically small-scale IndyCar teams, you know, yeah, right. or small-scale NASCAR Formula One teams. You know, it's you have to be with the right teams. There's different engine builders. There's different shock programs. There's different engineers. And because it's Atlantic, too, it's not all the hot shit engineers on stuff. It's everyone's progressing through that series, whether you're a driver or not. You yes, know? So. yeah, exactly. Some of the engineers were like beginner engineers that really were never going to turn out that great of a car. Right. Some of the engineers were fully worthy of being IndyCar engineers. They were elite. So mm-hmm. it made a big difference. Like which team you went to made a huge difference. And right. you can only, as you guys know, as a driver, if you don't have the car on a given day, you can only carry it so far. So yeah. you're either going to overdrive it and stuff it, or you're going to realize, okay, this is a fifth place car and I'm going to take it to fifth, maybe maybe fourth or third and that's it like there's nothing more i can't do anymore with the car right so um did you, know, you have any big um uh oh shit moments when driving like any close calls with 
you know yourself in qualifying just yeah a wall coming up too quick or yeah, other or, drivers. or did you or did you absolutely you know get that stuff out of the way in those first couple of moments no honestly yeah, two yeah. years old four honestly years old. more than <laughs> yeah, more yeah, right. more than i can remember more than i can remember i, I oh, actually wow. at one point i was bored when i first got into real estate one day i'd been cold calling <laughs> i'm like i don't want to i'm done working today and i actually i'm like before i get too old and forget i actually want to write a list of all of my close calls in life because oh, i've wow. had so many unbelievable close calls that were rather you know, gigantic explosions, wrecks, stupid stuff I did away from racing where I probably should have died right? because I was crazy. a crazy kid. Um, and I and I wrote out a list and definitely a third of that list is is huge wrecks, you know, wow. crazy, crazy wrecks that I had from a young age all the way up to, to an old age. Um, and thankfully never got really seriously injured. I, I broke my back on an ATV. That's my biggest injury Oof. when I was about 21. But in a car, never got hurt, never, never got seriously hurt, but got knocked out a couple times. Had a um, had an incident on the front straightaway at the Long Beach Grand Prix in 2006, where I was in a party train running about fifth in Daytona prototype, going about 150 through a flat out corner, and there was a massive explosion wreck right in front of me, and I had to do a left hook into the wall. I sawed through a car and went into the wall and got knocked out and hurt my leg. Holy crap! Um, so what I found was it, it actually there was no correlation to to age. Like the longer you race the more Murphy's law takes effect. And you guys probably know that from running a racetrack. Right. Like if you stand out here long enough, sooner or later, everything happens. You know, like sooner or later, a throttle sticks. Sooner or later, someone loses their brakes. Sooner or later, someone hits a barrier that you thought would never be hit. You just give it enough time. Yeah. There's and, no such thing as it can't happen. It, exactly. Yeah. And the racetrack, some, anything can happen. And there's times like, so, I mean, I've been training some new ups and new guys running the track this year. And they'll say, hey, what about this? I'm like, no, 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 we just, we don't say it. I'm like, if it happens, it happens and we'll deal with it. But I'm like, yes. we just, we don't put it out in the universe. You yes, know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You try to stay positive. Yeah. Um, but I, I never was a wrecker. I always race people clean. Um, very rarely would I ever take someone out. And if I did, it was a total accident. I, I always was about consistency. When I got into Toyota Atlantic the first year, my first full year in 2000, I finished every single lap of the season, um, That's awesome. which was one of the, I think I was only one of two people that ever did that in series history. So I, I knew I didn't have a winning car. I knew I had about an eighth place car and my goal was, okay, be smart. Don't wreck out, collect points, be as fast as you can take what the car gives you, but don't do stupid stuff. You know, ha have more of like a, a Scott Dixon mentality of like, you're just always going to make the best of the day, no matter what you're yeah, not going right, to, you're right, not right. going to be always doing crazy passes and well, doing stupid and stuff. It's going to keep you in the seat. You know I mean? At the yep. end of the day, uh, a team doesn't want somebody, okay, checkers or wreckers is fine and dandy, I suppose, if you've got big money and all other kinds of crap. But mm -hmm. if you're already not the top-level team, yes, it's really easy for that not top-level team to not race if they're spending a ton of money on fixing cars all the time. Yes. You know, there's and, a time and place. There's a time and place right. to go for it. Yeah. And there's a time and place to bring it home. And so you just got to – you got there's a lot of wisdom in knowing when, when that should be. And so – but I did some stupid stuff. There were, there were, some, there were some big wrecks um, over the years. But – Overall, you know, it was safe racing. We didn't we didn't really have Hans devices until maybe 2001, 2002. Um, we didn't have wheel tethers. We didn't have the new you know roll bar protection over the head. Yeah. So there was some danger, and we were doing oval racing. Like I was racing high speed oval tracks. Oval racing is usually quite a bit more dangerous than the road course stuff. Um, but I have just amazing memories. I mean, all those years doing that. My dad was at all the races with me. I was going to ask, what yeah. was his involvement? Was he just the dad and, yeah you know just hanging out with you at this point no he he actually was on the radio and he was in essence the driver coach radio spotter for me for all of those years oh you cool. know and he had to be careful because you know some of these race teams have had bad experiences with dads especially for dads sure. that aren't racers but i think most of the teams understood that he was experienced and he was he was always going to help me he was he wasn't going to be a detriment so he would he basically came to every single thing he could and he was there 99 percent of the time and so i ended up winning um winning a couple atlantic races towards the end what was the team you were aligned with for atlantics i raced for uh p1 racing in two in 1999 and 2000 and then in 2001 we didn't really have a team to go with and the the title sponsor who was behind me wrote us a smaller check and said do the do the most you can with this and so i actually went with one of the worst teams like a backmarker team yeah uh called condor motorsports and i raced with them 
about 80% of the season and then jumped in with another mid pack team for the last race at Laguna. And I got my first win at Laguna Seca in 2001 in Atlantic. Oh, cool. And, and um, arguably with a team that maybe shouldn't have been there. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Definitely a mid, mid pack team. They'd never won a race before. So this is hello, everybody. Rocky Moran right here. Yeah. Yeah. And I was racing Joey hand, which was really cool because oh, jo nice. Joey and I grew up racing carts together. So it was him and I basically going at it. Yeah. He was on the front row. I passed him on the start and he was on my bumper for most of the race. And so that was really cool to share it with him. It was, I think me and Joey and, um, I got to think about who was on the podium with us there. I think Hoover Orsi. Um, ended up finishing second there the next year to Ryan Hunter Ray. So I always had good runs at Laguna because it was my home track. I was going to say, I liked I was, it, knew yeah. It. Um, it and, definitely played a part into it. Yeah, yeah. And then in 2002, I was with a better team. They were they were probably the best team I ever drove for. They had won races and won championships before. But that particular year, their program was not as strong. Um, we ended up getting multiple podiums, ended up winning the Grand Prix of Montreal, um, and I forget whether F1 was there that year or IndyCar was there that year, but that was probably the biggest race I ever won because it was in front of like 100,000 fans it yeah, was right, right before the big race. So that was really cool. And I had momentum going into potentially having a shot at being an IndyCar driver, but that was also at the time, like at that time they wanted Americans in IndyCar because so many of the foreign drivers and South Americans and Europeans were bringing in money and there had been cigarette money that had come in from South America in the nineties. Right. So yeah. there was kind of a shortage of American drivers and Ford was putting out signals that they were going to sponsor some American guys. So myself, Ryan Hunter Ray, John Fogarty, Alex Gurney, um, I'll forget a bunch of people, but th there was a short list of, li of like five, six, seven of us that someone was probably going to get a shot in, yeah. in IndyCar. And so I got to go do an IndyCar test and I was pumped up. I was close to doing it. And um, that was right uh, about the time where it reached a climax where CART and IRL, they had split apart back yeah, at that time. Right. And it, it, just it, thinking, really, yeah. it had really hurt IndyCar, you know, yeah, collectively. Mm -hmm. It had really hurt IndyCar. And so I was going down the CART road. I wanted to be like a road racer. I was, I loved oval racing, but I didn't want to just do exclusively ovals. Yeah. That, most of the guys going to that series were like sprint car guys yeah. and oval guys. Yeah, and, the IRL was definitely the, quote, NASCAR of, yes, of open the open stuff. wheel stuff. Yeah, Exactly right. Exactly. So I wanted to go the CART route, and I think CART that year went through a bankruptcy. I mean, they were in big financial trouble that year is that where it transitioned to champ car after that uh it took i don't think that they came together as one series until somewhere around no, no, not, 07, not, 08. Not oh, they, they renamed it yeah, yeah champ yeah. car and yes. then they had a different car the yes. uh, panos or whatever it was yeah but it took them a long time to finally like come together like, right and then, yeah, then right. teams from champ car started jumping back into the irl right. because they they wouldn't allow people from champ car to actually qualify for exactly, the 500 they were yeah. holding him hostage with the 500 so you're kind of in this tough spot where you you more like want to do the road course stuff maybe a smidgen of the oval thing uh however the series that you might try to go into is and again you're running atlantics yes. not indy lights exactly so you're already on that path anyway yeah so the teams, everything like that, you're on that side, and then that particular organization starts to take a bit of a shit, and you're like, well, yeah, damn like, it. This sucks. This is terrible timing. My, <laughs> this is not working out the way I saw it. So, uh, yeah, so it was fine. I mean, I, I was getting married at the time. I was turning 23. Uh, Moran Raceway was designed. We, my dad and I had been thinking about opening up a cart track, so it was kind of like a perfect parlay into something that I loved. I knew that the cart track was coming and I knew I was still young and there was time and I could pursue racing. And it was just like, Hey, it's, it's not going to work out this year. This is going to be my first time. I had been carting full time, you know, from 10 to 14 and then cars from 14 to 22. I basically was on the road racing for 12 years of my life straight. And this was the first time where I'm like, I don't have anything going. It's kind of it's kind of stalling out and coming Got to an it. end. But Moran Raceway was being born, and okay. that was going to like fully. That was the next five years of my life. So, so uh, you said there were several American drivers that maybe one of you guys is going to get picked. You were close or whatnot. And so yeah. this, I assume, this is towards the end of two preseason testing, kind of shaking babies, kissing hands, what have you, and it yeah. just doesn't materialize. It wasn't that you just didn't do it, but you're like, we're not going to do Atlantic again. Yep. And we're gonna if we don't move up, we're not running. Is that basically how that 
went yeah, down. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I to to get the ride at the time, to get the ride in Atlantic that would allow you to win the championship or at least have a fight to win the championship, it was about a million bucks. That's Oof. where the budgets had gone to. Yeah. And we were basically paying for travel, a couple little engine bills here and there. I mean, my dad was doing everything he could, but we, we were never going to be in a position to write a million dollar check to yeah. to buy another season in and Atlantic. Your primary and sponsor just wrote a smaller check. He was so, out. Yeah, he yeah. was out by then. Okay. He, he was gone. So that's really, we're like, okay, there's really no opportunity here plus i had already proved i had won races and it, like i went to this indy car test with those guys i was one of the fastest guys got a lot of good pr out of it um where was the yeah. test at it was at firebird in okay. 2002 and i remember alex gurney walking up to me afterwards he's like honestly he's like you look no different than paul tracy driving an indy car he's like i would have no idea like whether it's him or you driving it and he'd hung around the track a lot so what was cool is all the karting all the atlantic all the barber dodge it had totally prepared me for an indy car when i got in an indy car Everything was happening quicker, but it really wasn't that difficult to drive because it did everything well. It had more downforce. It had more grip. It, it yeah. just, it was just awesome. It, everything worked. Yeah, everything <laughs> worked. I'm like, this isn't that complicated. Like, it's physical. You got to be in good shape to drive this thing. But um, it really, if if you had been driving, you know, even shifter carts, a shifter cart is about the most physical thing in the world you can drive. If you if you can do long runs in a shifter cart on a hot day and get out and be in good shape. You can pretty much drive an Indy car or a Formula One car. The races are longer. That's the big thing is you just right, got to right. have the endurance. But the physicality, you're much more locked in the seat. Um, the G-forces aren't much different than a, than a shifter cart. So everything I'd done, it prepared me for it. It went really well. I felt good about it. It was awesome. It just, uh, there wasn't any opportunity there. And I had a lot of other good stuff going on in my life. And I knew I, I still had some time on the clock. So I wasn't too stressed out about it. And um that's kind of when the Moran Raceway deal, that's when that happened. And and from Moran Raceway to current, all the car stuff I did after that, thereafter, it was all kind of sporadic, uh, a lot of arrive and drive stuff. My managers at the time, they're like, hey, you need to get away from IndyCar. You need to go to NASCAR. You need to, you need to move to South Carolina. It's all about NASCAR. And they were right. I mean, at the time... NASCAR, IndyCar was was dwindling. Yeah, and yeah, NASCAR was exploding. Right, and I'm like, man, I really don't want to move to North Carolina. You know, like, did you have any desire to even go to do NASCAR though, or you not? Like, not really. Yeah. Like NASCAR, you know, to me, until the last ten laps, it was kind of boring. I didn't really watch the races. I had watched every single IndyCar race from the time I was young. You know, right. like probably. 13, 14, every single IndyCar race from 1993 to 2021, I've watched every single one. So that's what I've always been about. That's what I always wanted to do. N never F1. I've always appreciated F1, mm -hmm. always appreciated the tracks and the technology, but I just always loved IndyCar. That was always my thing. Had, had you ever been in a tin top? You ever done a sports car or anything like that? So they talked me into it. They're like, okay, you got to do it. You got to go do this. I'm like, let's let's go. Let's do it. So I was, uh, we had had Moran Raceway open for a few years and I went down. Um, but sorry, before you go yeah. into that, so that in 23, yeah. you, you don't run. Exactly. And then do you, so yeah, towards the end, you're doing Moran, before we get into all the Moran stuff, yeah. and then maybe, maybe we're going to hit it right here. 24, you're like, okay, I'm going to try it again. Or... Yeah. Or and you say it was sporadic, so kind of maybe just putting a point on that that piece, yeah. You know, getting a chance, you already talked about the, the crash and the and the prototype and stuff like that. Yes, so I jumped ahead a little bit. Yeah. Uh, eventually, you you got in there, but as far as your career going from nonstop to pause, it doesn't it doesn't ever jump start after that. Then, no, I mean uh, it it, uh, it did jump start several times. It did jump start oh, okay. several times, which is cool. Um, but I never like I always considered. To be a full-time paid race car driver, like that's got to you got to sign with a team and you got to be there for a long period of time, or at least be in that series for a long period of time. And sure. that that never really happened after okay. that. It was always short stints. It was always last minute. Here's the team, go. You got one race or maybe two races with them. Yeah, I did get a full season later on with one team, but um, but it never it it never turned into something where I could say, okay, I'm done with real estate. I'm just gonna fully I'm, I'm i made it i'm a race car driver now yeah, that's it right. it never it ne that never happened so gotcha. uh which is fine because I, I did have a lot of good runs and a lot of good races after that i actually before the before the nascar thing came back uh, or or it actually started um when i was 22 when i was 23 it was all moran raceway when i was 24 i got called back to do two or three atlantic races um and got a podium in my first race back it came back very quickly because i had been living in a shifter car at moran raceway oh, oh, so nice. I, I got in an atlanta car i'm like this is like a Easy. cadillac this is nothing you yeah. know a shifter car is way more work than well, an atlanta car was that a little so, bit begrudging 
getting um, back into the series that you're like I needed to get out of. You know, it was at the time it was just like this is fun, this is cool. It's not going to go anywhere. It's okay. going to it's going to be a few races. I love racing so much that if I can go get a shot with a halfway decent team, I just want to go. You're okay. appreciating I wanna go. it. Yeah, I yeah. want to go. I'm just appreciating it for what it is. Okay, like fully smelling the roses at the racetrack. Awesome. Like I'm back in the car. Like this is awesome. Nice. Um, but knowing it's not a championship run, it's not a full time deal. They were in between drivers, and they knew I was qualified and, and brought me in. And uh, that happened one more time in 2005. There was an Atlantic team that that wanted to do the Long Beach Grand Prix, and they called me up, and I had raced for them before. It was P1 Racing, who I raced with in, uh, in 2000, and I needed a, a little bit of sponsorship, so I went to Raul Martinez, King Taco. Oh, neat. Yeah, yeah. I think I remember re- hearing about this or reading about this one. Yeah, yeah. Ra- Raul was always so cool, so generous to me. He sponsored Moran Raceway and sponsored some. ended up sponsoring a lot of my racing, but he helped out a little bit with that race, and I went down there and qualified fifth and raced my way to the lead and was leading the race with a lap to go and had a wheel bearing failure at the God Long Beach Grand Prix. Dang it. And wow. that was uh that was just a one off race. It was literally a one off like a just show up and go. Um I was 25, I was in my prime. I was living in a go-kart. Um so way easier to do then than it would be to do now at 41 sure. walking mm-hmm. around 20 pounds overweight. <laughs> you know, I'm not in I'm not in like fighting shape right now, but back right. then I was. So I was like I can do that. Like sure. no no problem. Jump in and go. Yep, yep. And I I had so many laps in those cars that it was second nature like you guys have done enough karting to where if you're out of the cart for a year and you get in, it's a little bit weird at first, but you have so much muscle memory and you've done it so many times that it comes back faster than you think. Yeah. We, yeah. we actually had talked about that when uh, we had taken three months off of not driving anything Yep. and, uh, and then, okay, so pro cart was going to be here and it's like, oh, well we need to get, or no, they're going to be Will, uh, Willow. Yeah. I was like, well, we need to go test at Willow. Yeah. And so first time back in the car after three months off and no, I wasn't as in good a shape, but still ran over 100 laps or whatever and like after the and, first session I'm like all right i, yeah. I still remember <laughs> exactly <laughs> and, but did yeah. the neck hurt more yeah probably the first time my neck hurt I and mean, i can't remember when was the last time it was like holy shnikes isn't but, that weird racing shape like the muscles you use yeah. racing you, they're yeah. kind of hard to develop those muscles in the gym you're, exactly. you're, you're best to develop them in a car or in a cart yeah because you're just you're using weird muscles your neck and your triceps and yeah. stuff that you usually don't spend a ton of time working that's the out. argument i have with my yeah. wife i'm like honey i'm in great race shape yes exactly. yeah yeah right <laughs> she's like but you I, your six pack's gone yeah like, you're, don't worry about that you know, it's protected yeah. by a layer of fat i gotta yeah. keep it safe i like this rocky guy your six pack's gone it's like like i had one in the beginning. <laughs> trying to be as flattering yeah, as possible there you, know? you go <laughs> so you, uh, you you end up almost winning long beach grand prix there in five and whatnot again yeah really smelling the roses enjoying the piss out of whatever it is that you get an opportunity to do yes what happens in, in six in there? And then, and, and like you said, you got another full time ride. Well, about that time, my managers had talked me into going and doing some stock car racing in Bush East. And I only ended up ever doing maybe three or four races total. Uh, but it was a total culture shock, you know, for me. And I always felt like my advantage was in the race. I was always a good qualifier, but a better racer. And, um, and so, I could appreciate in, in stock car racing, like it's all about racing. Like it's, right. it's tight. You get, you're working the draft. Uh, it, there's a lot of strategy. Um, open wheel racing is a little bit more follow the leader. Um, you know, it's a little bit more about where you qualify and track position and you can kind of break free and disappear, you know, drive off into the sunset. Yeah. A lot right. harder to do that in stock car racing. It happens, but it's harder to do. And so I went there and um didn't really know what to expect got in the car and you know i was back east i was in the northeast and these guys have like a thick accent these guys are like from the woods i could barely understand what they were saying on the radio um i immediately think of ward burton when he said that's what they talk like and i'm like i i'm like i do not understand what you're saying you know i just heard i just just, just heard like go fast try hard whatever yeah Yeah. rocky's i gotta get a different spotter yeah Yeah. (laughs) so my first race was at a a half mile track called Erie. Um, I think it was in Pennsylvania, but I don't remember. Uh, or you know what? It was in New York. It was at some half mile track in I think Holland, New York. And, um, I went out and qualified like mid pack. Um, I think it was a mid pack car, mid pack effort. It wasn't a full-time team. And the moment I got in the race, it instantly dawned on me that stock car racing is the most fun racing in the universe because wow. it, it's like turn one of an Indy car race or an Atlantic race or a cart race, but sustained like every lap, like every lap is literally, you've got 
two or three guys in front of you. You got two or three guys behind you. People are leaning on you. There's crap spraying all over your windshield. It's loud. It's hot. The things sound like monster trucks. If you want to go racing. Yeah. And it's biased by tires. So you got, you know, it's forgiving. So the car can get really crossed up and you can still save it. It's not mm-hmm. like an IndyCar at the Speedway where, you know, you get a little loose and you're dead, you know, like, right. yeah, yeah. Like, like, <laughs> yeah. So it's, it, they were very, very fun cars to drive. The racing was unbelievable. And I remember just like, at moments, I just had a grin on my face. I'm like, this is so much fun. This is way, way, way more fun than I thought and way more interesting than it than it appears to be watching it on TV. When you're actually in the car and you're out there and, and you've got guys leaning on you and grinding on your car for like an hour straight, you get yeah. out and you're like, I can't believe I just did that. This, this, is, ridi- this is like Mad Max. This is ridiculous. <laughs> and so um, there, I think if you're an open wheel purist and you go stock car racing, no matter what, there's going to be there's going to be some culture shock with the sure, racing, yeah. with the people, with yeah. everything. I mean, you get even, even your suit, you wear the, the different suit that like, uh, the, the boot what cut. are they called? Yeah. The boot yeah. cut, right. <laughs> I showed up without the boot cut and I was like the instant nerd, you a know? little I'm less like, uh, Euro. Yeah. There. They're like, this guy's just like a Euro weenie. You see, <laughs> we we got to get this pansy out of here. He's from California. <laughs> and so, uh, so I, I ended up doing two or three races. I, I raced at, um, I raced at uh, Loudon in New Hampshire, which is a one-mile kind of paperclip-shaped yeah, yeah. track. Probably the coolest oval track I've ever raced on because it was like drag racing these long, fast straightaways and then braking hard for the corners. Um, you really, really had to drive it. That, that Sorry, just yeah. to interrupt. That totally reminds me of the Milwaukee Mile. Did you ever get yep. a chance to do that one? Yeah, so I only ran Milwaukee in an Atlantic car. Uh-huh. And it, the, the irony of that is an Atlantic car is so different than these stock cars. It yeah. has so much downforce and oh. so much grip that we were actually stone flat at get Milwaukee. So Whoa. I set the track record in Atlanta car Milwaukee in December of 2000, or what was it? Maybe December of 01 or, or January of 02. It was like a 24.6 second lap and it was stone flat in an Atlantic it car. It was like Holy India, crap. but yeah, for it's an Atlantic. Indian. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. So, um, so it was Just Milwaukee. Don't hit the curb. Milwaukee was <laughs> yeah. the ultimate suck it up track in a, in an Atlantic car. Wow. Really, really a sketchy place. Um, but in a stock car, it would be more like that. You know, it's, okay. it's, it does have shorter straightaways. It does have bigger corners, very historic, very cool track. Um, no real banking there, flat corners. Yeah. yeah. Um, but Loudon in a stock car was just perfect because you had enough time to drag race guys down straightaways and then have these long brake zones. You know how that is at any track. If yeah. you got long enough straightaway and a long enough brake zone, there's going to be a ton of passing. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it was just a continual stuff fest and you know you're just stuffing guys and they're stuffing you and, and it's pretty wide too yep yeah yeah it was it was the best i had so much fun i i grew a lot of respect uh for all of these guys and what they do and i remember I, I raced the car several times into the top 10 um in like 40 car fields maybe even 50 car fields they were very very deep well attended fields back at the time um not really knowing what i was doing and just relying on everything i had known from open wheel racing and, and just, I remember getting out of the car and one of the guys that finished ahead of me got out. He was like 55 years old, bald, <laughs> gray goatee, beer belly. And I'm like, how did that guy just kick my ass? Like, right. what, yeah. How did that just happen? You know, but it, it dawned on me. I'm like, this is a lot less about physicality and it's a lot more about technique. Yeah. You know, like if, if you, you know race these doing, cars long yeah. enough, there's some dudes back there that are insanely good at, at, at it and they got the car control and everything. They got everything working. And so I liked it because I felt like there was less disparity there. There still is disparity. Like you still, the guy that's got the best car, he has the best car and you're not going to run him down. But it was a lot more close than a lot of the open wheel racing I had done. And so pack racing was what you liked. Yeah. I felt like a good driver could make a bit more of a difference there. At least the series I was running in, Uh, but did three or four races there. Same deal. It always comes down to budget and it's like, okay, to race there full time, to race for Andy Santier's team, who was the best team at the time. I became buddies with him. He would have given me like a 50% off, uh, you know, deal to race with him, but I still would have had to come up with a half a million bucks. And yeah. that was not, I'm, that just wasn't in the cards. And that know? was mid twenties. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That was like Oh five. Yeah. Yeah. So that's I did some cool races that, in Oh four Oh five Oh six. That's so cool to know you had that opportunity though. Yeah, like, there's because you'd only been open wheel exclusively, and then you're like, ah, I don't really want to do that. But later on, it comes up, and you got to, and you're like, that was a lot of fun. There's very few drivers that have had the opportunity to run open wheel, like starting carts, go to open wheel cars, do Atlantic IndyCar stuff, then go do uh, NASCAR, you know, uh, 
NASCAR oriented racing yeah. and then go do sports car as well. I got to do all of it. So it was fun. And I do some off-road stuff too. So to, oh, to get to go do all of that uh, and compare it all to one another and think about how different it is. I, I love it all. It was all in its, in its own right. It was all the best. It was so much fun. To go back to the open wheel stuff for a second. Um, yeah. How did you feel on the road courses or the um, street courses? Excuse me. Uh, on open wheel. Yeah. That was probably my weakest link looking back. Um, I got a lot better at it as time, as time went on, but I always liked the flowing high speed Laguna Seca road, America F1 style tracks. That's what mm -hmm. we infused a lot of in, in Timberland raceway, the tracks that were lots of slow, tight, stop and go, stop and stuff. go. Yeah. took me a while to figure that out because I was a guy that would always carry in too much entry speed early on, uh, break super deep, carrying too much entry speed and not always get the shot out of the corner. And I'm, when I was younger, I wasn't always connecting all those dots and I wasn't getting my car right. And you got to really get the setup. You know, the setup is critical at street courses and they're bumpy and they're blind. And yeah. it, it, it was something that grew on me. That was probably the last thing to come for me was the street course race. And I really liked the ovals. I really liked the road courses. Um, some of the places we raced at were temporary circuits like, uh, like, Cleveland airport. So they would oh, shut right. down an airport yeah. and it had all these crazy high speed corners and stuff. I love those types of places. So, um, yeah, I mean that, that was, uh, th they're definitely more technical, definitely more tricky. Um, and I, I had a good balance of those. I, I, I got there, I got to a yeah. point where I was fast at street tracks. It's all comfort though. Yeah, yeah. Different drivers adapt differently to different types of circuits. Like you look at someone like Will Power. Um, one of the fastest guys in the world, tons of poles, right? And it took him a while when he when he went uh, to oval race. He he wasn't very good, and it took yeah. him years to get there. And right. he, he finally clicked, and he ended mm -hmm. up winning the Indy Five Hundred. And some people are just wired, you know, differently. As you look back on that car career, is there one particular moment where like that was the shining achievement, or that was the thing? And then yeah. linking to that because you're still not too old. Yeah, exactly. I'm true. only a couple of years year ish younger, so I try to. <laughs> Uh, you could still go out there and, and do some of that stuff if you you know wanted to set your mind yep. to it and obviously money blah blah blah. Yep. But two twofold was there one thing that you're like that was the shining achievement and is there one thing that you'd want to go back and do if you if you could? Yeah. yeah. Well, the wins in Toyota Atlantic and Barber Dodge really stick out uh, because they were we were there grinding it out for many years and I was racing against really good drivers and to beat all those guys to to race in those fields and to beat those guys. It meant a lot at the time, and winning is always what you know sticks out in your mind. Sure, even though there may may have been many other races where where I put on a similar or even better drive, but I ended up finishing fifth, coming you know back for coming from further back in the field. Um, you know, there's a lot of memorable events over the years, but the the four wins I had in Barber Dodge and Atlantic were all I was like on a high for a week after this. Like I was just so stoked, so happy. Cause there was just so much time and effort that went into those races and it took a while to get there. And then, um, leading the Long Beach Grand Prix in 05, breaking down at the end, it was bittersweet, but a very, very good memory. Um, hometown crowd. Yeah. yeah. Hometown yeah. crowd. Exactly. All the, a lot of the Carters at the time were coming out to support me because Moran oh, raceway yeah. had been up and running for multiple years. How cool. So I had a little peanut gallery there to support me, which was, nice. which was super <laughs> cool. And the Carters have always been so supportive and so good to us. So that was fun. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I actually went to the last time I was in a race car, uh, I'm probably jumping ahead here, but the last time I was in a race car was a couple summers ago and I got invited by a wealthy gentleman who owns an automotive museum, uh, used to sponsor my dad in the Indy 500 and he owns a ridiculous amount of race cars, famous race cars that have won races from all different eras. He's here in Corona oh, wow. and he happens to own my dad's 24 hour winning Daytona, um, Toyota GTP car. Oh, wow. Uh, awesome. This Eagle <laughs> race car that's an absolute rocket ship. It was basically the car that dominated the GTP era at the end. It was faster than a Formula One car and an Indy car at the time. GTP was so badass. Totally sick. So totally sick. Cool. And I'd always dreamed of driving that car. And uh, he actually called me up a couple summers ago. He's like, hey, there's this big, famous vintage race at Laguna Seca of all places. Oh, no oh, nice. You want to come drive the car? I'm like, yes, I'm in. Yeah. 100% yeah. I'm in. That and, track, that car. Yeah, I'm yeah. like, this is like a fantasy. <laughs> so, um, uh, I went there. My dad went there. Rocky Jr. went there, which was cool because that's like the only time Rocky's really been old enough to see me drive a car, oh, see me wow, drive a car, yeah. um, and, and like really fully remember it. And basically, I, w I qualified on the pole. 
was winning races. Yeah, was you had the, the best car. Come on. <laughs> I did. I did. And it was finally nice to have that. Yeah. You know, yeah. In a car. yeah. It, I actually told my dad that after the weekend, I'm like, it really is amazing when you have an unfair advantage in racing. You know, what happens? You right. know, when you give a good driver the best car, uh, it's, it's the best. I mean, that you can't do anything wrong. So how did that thing handle it? You know, they had it on, um, these Avon tires, which are designed for, guys that race vintage races mm -hmm. and they had the motor a little bit detuned so it was nowhere up to snuff of what it was when my dad was driving right. it they had it they had it the gearing was goofy and stuff but it was still a monster and and they they let me shake it down at big willow um which big willow is about the craziest place you can drive a race car other than india i mean it's it's a very very high commitment place in a race car mm -hmm. turn two turn eight turn nine turn one they're just full commitment corners and so driving it around there and i had been i had never driven that car and it had been a long time since i had driven a car that fast um the thing that blew me away was the turbo because it was a four-cylinder motor and it ran a very high boost level and uh -huh. and the turbo hit like a aggressive two-stroke dirt bike i mean it just hit and threw your head back and wow. so at a place like Big Willow where you can open it up, I was just in shock. I was like, I can't believe how fast this thing is. This is unbelievable. Seniors on the radio going, you definitely need a break later, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's getting yeah. back into the coaching. <laughs> exactly, exactly. He was, he was giving me some tips. It was awesome. That's pretty cool. <laughs> but I'll tell you, my my probably the most amazing memory from racing, which led to no, led to nothing, but was probably the one of the coolest moments of my life in racing, um, I had always, as I mentioned earlier, everything I was doing was trying to build towards being an IndyCar driver. That was always my dream. I always wanted to do it. Um, it, you know, wasn't meant to be kind of got sidetracked with life and yeah. kids and marriage and ran raceway and real estate and it, racing really to do it right. You've got to be all in. It's a full commitment thing. Right. So to try to be really good at my day job and really good at racing, one of those things is going to suffer, which right. is part of why I haven't been able to do it because I, if I can't do it, you know, right, it's not something I want to do. And if I can't do it with a good team, it's really not something I want to do. And so, um, I got, uh, this opportunity to just do a random IndyCar test to test an IndyCar 34 years old. Um, we had been calling Dale coin. Who's a guy that gives, you know, people opportunities, yeah. you know, more of a, back of the field team, obviously, but his, his effort had improved over the years. He was getting better drivers, better engineers, and actually his cars were, were coming a long way. So I went and did a, a just a random half day test down at Homestead. I was about a second off of the pace, um, had not been in a car or a cart for a while. I actually came out here to Cal speed to do a little bit of karting with uh, Francois with DMG to just kind of tune myself up. And I popped a rib oh, on man. karting, which you guys know that's not good, right? No. <laughs> and so my, my rib was was not in good shape going to this test and it was hurting me and I had to go to the doctor's office and get numbed up before I got in the car. But I'm like, this is th the coolest thing ever. I'm gonna drive an Indy car at 34, yeah. somehow pulled off this test. Um, the test went, went well overall. Um, it started raining later in the day and I didn't get to finish the day. And so that was it, just a test, one, one, day, one day test. Nothing happened. I got a little bit of press out of it. Rock and Rand tested an Indy car. Robin Miller wrote a story on it. And, oh, cool. And that, that was it. And then um, I got a call two days before the Long Beach Grand Prix in 2015. This is what I remember. Yeah, yeah. And at this point, this I'm like, at awesome. this point, I'm like 35 years old. I'm a little chubby. You know, I've been drinking bourbon. I just, I just got into bourbon. Like, <laughs> and I'm not even a drinker, but I, my friends had just got me into bourbon. And so I'd been drinking bourbon on a routine basis for like like three or four nights a week. It wasn't because wasn't the, in the Indy gym. car test didn't go well. Yeah, it, uh, maybe. It was, okay. Maybe. <laughs> you know, I was really starting to get bummed out on life. Yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> losing my course. Right. Uh, and so, um, and so he gives me this call. He's like, "Hey, he's like, uh, Rocky, he's like, are you are you available to drive an Indy car this weekend?" True story. Like, no warning whatsoever. Forty eight hours before the Long Beach Grand Prix. Holy crap! I think he called me on a Tuesday afternoon, and I would have needed to be there on a Thursday afternoon to practice Friday morning. And so I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, for sure, I'm in." You know, like like knowing that like there's no way this is gonna turn your, out good. Your mm -hmm. mouth you and know? everything says yes, and your brain hasn't even finished figuring <laughs> out like, what just yeah. happened. I cannot back this up. You know, yeah, like. My mind is there, the talent is there, but physically, this is not going to work out, you know. Oh, and so, man. and so, I'm like, yeah, uh, yeah, 100. percent And he's like, um, he's like, how how do you do with that test? You know, like like six months ago, how were you? I'm like, 
I was pretty good. He's like, how far were you off the pace? I'm like, I don't know, maybe like a half second, you know, something like that, you know, kind of rounding down in my yeah, favor. Yeah. Yeah. Also and, didn't yeah. finish the day. The yeah, wind it, was coming it, it from rained. the east. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't take the ballast weight out of my car. Yeah. You know, You're like, head, my room's better now, but. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so he's like, okay. He's like, well, the, the driver that we had in the car, um, uh, I think his name was Carlos Huertas. His money didn't show up. And so, oh, wow. um, can you put together any money at all? I'm like, if I can on this short of notice, it's going to be like peanuts. It's going to be like, I, like I can buy a set of tires and like some fuel yeah. and like my hotel room, but it's not, I do I really do not have money to allocate towards this event. Right. He's like, okay. So he's like, something's better than nothing. I'll call you back. I'm like, okay. I'm like, what do I need to do? He's like, well, here's the contact for IndyCar. Go get your drug test fill out the paperwork, get your license, um, you know, maybe consider buying a helmet, you know, and this is on like 48 hours notice, you know, yeah. my, my helmet's like a eight year old helmet. that's not up to, up you're to like, hey, right. if I buy the helmet, you're I don't not even, getting any fuel. I don't have the current Hans device. <laughs> I don't have the current suit. I don't have any of that stuff. And so, um, and so he's like, yeah, stay tuned. Um, I'll let you know. And I'm like texting him, calling him the next day, trying to figure out what I'm going to do. I'm still out doing real estate appointments. Like life is going on. He's not really responding to me. Um, 24 hours before I'm supposed to be at the track, he texts me at like 4:30. He's like, he's like, I think it's gonna happen. He's like, but I'm not sure. He's like, maybe. He's like 50-50. And I'm like, how could he be cutting it this close? This yeah. is insane. Like, this is unbelievable. And he's like, I'll let you know by five. Five o'clock comes around. He doesn't reply. Five fifteen. It was five thirty, and I told my wife, I'm like, let's just get in the car and go to dinner. Like, this is not. This was never gonna happen. So we're literally in the car driving to dinner with our kids, and he calls me up. He's like, you're in. He's like, you're gonna drive the Long Beach Grand Prix in an Indy car. And I was like in shock. I'm like, you have to be kidding me. This is absurd. You know, like, I can't believe this is actually going to happen. So I'm like, this is great. I'm like, I'll be there, you know? And so I drove down there that night, you know, 24 hours before. I, I mean, technically 36 hours before I was supposed to be in the car. But basically, you know, that Wednesday night, I drove down there, booked a hotel in San Pedro, um, kind of in the hood. And uh, and that's not, all of San Pedro, right, Derek? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> He's from Pedro. I'm there's from some, Pedro. There's yeah. some good parts and bad parts. You, yeah, know? you gotta you gotta stay above Pacific. Is yeah. what I tell people. Yeah, I was yeah. like next to like some gas station and like an inn. I mean, I, there was nothing. Left, oh, you know? yeah. I'm like, I'll I stay I, anywhere. I think I know what you're talking about. I'll sleep on the sidewalk. Lucky, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe you chose the right weekend. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, before before you yeah. go on, um, the whole day you're you're texting, you're not getting responses. Were you? Was there half of you saying, I really hope he just says no or, 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 you know, so you can get your hopes back down and not think about it? Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Like, don't keep me in limbo. You can't dangle this carrot in front of me. It's way, you're, I'm yeah. way, I, this is way too much, you know? And so, uh, he said, yes, I was, I was dumbfounded. I'm like, I, no one would do this with this short of notice. Uh, this is kind of how he is though. He's an eccentric guy. Okay. He likes to give people opportunities. Mm-hmm. He's disorganized. He's old school. He doesn't really reply to text. He doesn't, ha- he had like a Nokia candy bar phone in 2015. <laughs> so like if he wants to call people up, he pulls out a pad of paper and all the names are on the, that's just how he oh, operates, wow. but smart guy, you know, cool dude. Um, and and so I got down there, didn't have a seat. They had to pour me a seat. I'm sitting in an Indy car, like looking ahead of me and like the Andretti transporters in front of me. Your I'm like, cheeks hurt so bad yeah. from smiling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're, well, they're, they're handing me like a gear sheet. I'm like trying to memorize all the gears. I was about in the to say car. the Andretti transports ahead of you, but you got your easy up behind you. And that's yes. where you're, yeah, that's yes, where you're at. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so um, I'm meeting, they're introducing me to all the people on the team, full information overload. Like they're telling yeah. me how to get in and out of the pits. I'd never driven a car that has a clutch on the steering wheel. Oh, I'm wow. trying to memorize the gear lap, the, the gear, you know, like the, they're giving me speed traces from Justin Wilson's data from the previous year. I'm looking at that. And so I'm just trying to like get myself up to speed as quickly as possible. And, um, and I'm like, wow, this is really going to happen. And so, uh, got through all the paperwork, got all my licenses, got my helmet all rigged up with the radios, went out on Thursday, uh, or I guess Friday morning, whatever it was, uh, went out in the car, um, and actually felt more comfortable in the car than I had six months before that. I was braking deep. I was on it. Uh, my dad was in the grandstands. He's like, you look really, really good. Like, yeah, your rib was where it was supposed to be. Exactly. That <laughs> yeah. helps. That helps. Um, was quicker than my teammate at the time. I, was, oh, I, I put a lot of speed on my teammate like right out of the gate and um, ran a couple sessions. And I was towards the back of the field because that's just where those cars ran i mean at yeah. the time they were not fast cars but all i could all i could hope for was to beat my teammate and and i accomplished that and so um 
in the last session before qualifying, I got uh, turned around. I got stuffed really late. I didn't have a spotter. At that point in time, they had gone to all new body work and the mirrors were like tiny. You basically couldn't see behind you. And even if you could, I was so in shock. I was just focusing on just driving fast. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not looking behind me. You yeah. know? Someone's <laughs> going to pass me. They're going to pass me. Um, and I got stuffed late. He turned me around and um, kind of dumped me into the tire barrier in turn one. Was it your teammate? Uh, no, it, it was it was Carlos Munoz with uh, oh, really? with uh, Andretti. Okay, and it was it, you know, it was unnecessary for practice. He probably shouldn't have done it. I think if I was more experienced and I had more visibility or a spotter, I wouldn't have turned in. But it was a late pass, yeah. you know. So it just it was one of those racing things, I guess. And uh, and I didn't realize until later on, like two hours afterwards, my thumb was like killing me. It was throbbing. I guess I had enough shock going on to where I just didn't feel it. And I woke up the next morning for qualifying, and I couldn't move my thumb. I couldn't pull my socks on. I couldn't squeeze oh, toothpaste wow. out of the tooth, toothpaste tube. I'm like, man, this is what I thought I had just kind of like jammed it. And it, instead of getting, you know, going from worse to better, it went from worse to just totally non functional. I'm like, my thumb is just done. So walking in, um, I, I went into the IndyCar Medical, they x rayed it, they sent the images to Trammel. Um, and Trammell's like, dude, he's like, you need surgery on your thumb. Your thumb's like, it's like 80% broken. It's like hanging on by a thread. Oh my gosh. I'm like, is there any way you can shoot it up? Like any way you can numb this and we can just like blow this over. He's like, no, he's like, you could never, you know, you could never do it. So, um, well, I and at the end of the day, right, if it ain't working and things aren't right, they don't want to put you out there. Of course. It know? would have been a disaster. I would not have been able to drive with it. It was way too broken. It yeah. was, we're not talking about a fracture. It was like, it was hanging on. It was, it basically. The ligaments are doing the job. It was bad. Get it was going. bad. Yeah. So, uh, so I had to go tell the team that morning, Hey, my thumb's broken. <laughs> not going to be able to, just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to be able to drive. Uh, went from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows. That's oh, how racing goes. Yeah. If you race enough, you know how it goes. And, um, and at the time. He, he actually looked at me. He's like, who should I put in the car? Um, and I knew that Connor Daly had been I was going to say, lane. He, I think he was hanging out that weekend. And he, he got the, that morning. Yeah, they put him in. Yeah, I yeah. remember that. And I'm like, put Connor Daly in the car. I'm like, he he's totally qualified. Connor had his own seat. He was like walking around with. He ran in there. <laughs> Get a little red wagon in. behind him with everything. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. And Connor got in and he basically was the same position on the grid I was. He had already done more IndyCar stuff. He was quicker than I was, um, but had more experience at the time and and not too much quicker. The track was getting quicker. They were throwing tires at the car. I mean, it was good to know, like, okay, he's a good benchmark. And I was basically right yeah. there. Nice. And um, and thank God, actually, looking back, like, I, I literally thank God that I didn't run that entire race because the race went green flag the entire time. Ooh, it was like oh, a record wow. hot day. And I'm like, I don't, I, I, I was prepared to do it. Like my, my game plan was I'm going to like literally drive in a red mist as hard as I can this entire race until physically I can't do it anymore. And then at that point, I'm just going to smash the wall. Like that, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that was my game plan. Like, like that's, and I knew it was going to happen. I'm like, at some point my body's just going to shut down, Yeah, but I'm, I'm willing to go down with the ship because this is the coolest thing ever, you yeah. know? So, um, never, never got to find out what was going to happen. He got plugged in. He did a great job. He called me a week later and thanked me. And it was cool because the Indy 500 was what, 10 days ago. And he was, uh, he led, I think the, he led the most the laps. Race. Yeah. yeah. So it was, it was cool to see that parlay into an opportunity for him. That's so That's badass. so cool. That's yeah. such a cool story. So it's funny. I've, cause I grew up in San Pedro. Our thing as a family was every year go to the Grand Prix in Long Beach. And I think I've like. I'm 27 now. I maybe missed like three years of it or so. But yeah. to think back to how many times I've seen cars go around the track and how many times I've actually seen you race around that track, mm -hmm. whether it was Atlantic or the DP that you were yes. talking about or, or now that. Yeah. It's so funny. It, he's telling the star, I was like, shit, is this when Connor gets put in the car? Because oh, nice. I remember that morning they do a big announcement saying Phil and Connor Daly gets to drive. Yes. And I'm like, and my dad was a big Derek Daly fan. That's actually who I was named after. Der Derek was awesome. So, yeah. Uh, to hear Connor, the kid got put in, I, I was pretty stoked to hear that. And who knows that yeah. you were the guy that... I was yeah. actually really good buddies with Derek Daly because Derek Daly had a car racing school out in Vegas in the 90s, the mm -hmm. Derek Daly Driving Academy. And that was like my first job. So in between races, I would go out there and do driver coaching. He had a big fleet of BMW cars. Oh, very cool. similar to what you guys are doing here, but just with cars. Mm -hmm. I mean, he had a fleet of like, you know, uh, I think they were Z3 BMWs, they did corporate events, uh, racing schools, all of that kind of stuff. And he ran it primarily as an absentee owner because he was on the East Coast. I think Connor was an East Coast kid. Um, 
and and would come out but he would hire me as much as possible to go out there and a lot oh, of other man. young drivers from barber dodge and atlantic we would go out there and do that so uh i had already built a relationship with him i knew him um he uh he, i think he was in telecast uh he, he was one of the announcers like for yeah. various indy car races and my first atlantic race he was there gave me a big pat on the back so i had known That's his dad cool. Connor was quite a bit younger than me and didn't really meet Connor until um, he was out at Moran Raceway actually racing. He, he oh, was me. racing some big races when he was probably a teenager out there. Yeah, that's <laughs> so As cool. were a lot of current IndyCar drivers. Right. Exactly. You know? Yeah, yeah. Right, so you had mentioned that the entire time that you were you know doing the car stuff there through your 20s, right? Like was 20, 2002 or something yeah. like that? It was the, how did the Moran thing, you said it was kind of a, a, a dream deal, you and your dad. Yes. I, how did that whole thing come about and from just the idea side to how do you, where do you put it? And you said it was your guys' thing together, but you hadn't done carding or anything carding at that point for what, eight, 10 years. Yeah, exactly. Good question. So, uh, ultimately my dad was a catalyst behind the whole thing. Um, he was one of the few guys that could really pull it off because a, he's the ultimate racer and always wanted to do it and always thought it would be the coolest thing ever to have his own racetrack. And B, he was a real estate guy in Southern California. So he actually understood the process of how you entitle land, uh -huh. get through cities, line up the debt, construct it. Uh, he understood how to do all that stuff. There's a lot of people that would love to do it, but developing anything in California is a huge task. It's not, right. it's very, very difficult. And I imagine it's, it's only gotten more challenging. Way more challenging in the last 20 years. Uh, so... He had wanted to do it in the 90s because I remember him talking about it uh, when I was in high school and he had gone to various cities in Southern California. And I remember him having some little layouts he had worked on and um, he had kind of been feeling around. I don't think he was uh, putting a huge amount of effort into it, but it was something that was definitely he was thinking of, he was thinking about. It. He was kicking it around. Which is kind of interesting too, to, to maybe do something like take that kind of undertaking at the same time that you guys are still trying to do your car. Like you're working through the car game at that point too. To, yes. To have those two things is yes. kind of crazy. Exactly. Exactly. I think he thought that they could always go hand in hand, like whether or not I made it as a driver or not, he always thought it would be great to have a racetrack. Like it would be something cool for us to own regardless right. of how much I was there or not, you know, and there probably was always a higher chance I would be there. That's just how <laughs> racing is, you know? So he was Edging smart. That's a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He was smart. But, uh, ironically, one of the places where he gained a lot of traction and was very close to having his first racetrack, uh, when I was younger, it was probably late nineties. Um, I'm, I'm guessing on that, on those dates, but was right here in Fontana. Oh, wow. Uh, maybe a mile or two from here, not oh, far wow. at all. And he was trying, um, he was trying to do a deal with Edison underneath their power lines, because a lot of the land underneath the power lines yeah, the is essentially there, yeah. thrown throw away land that you can't develop. You yeah. can't do anything with. And if you, if you notice where most racetracks end up or a lot of them end up, they end up on airports um, because you're not bugging anyone out there. They can't build on it. That noise is an issue. Or they end up on some throwaway land like a dump or in a floodplain like Adams where, you know, you can't ever build there because it's in a flood basin. And right. so mm -hmm. uh, anytime you can find some unique scenario where it's not a normal site, that's probably a better site for a racetrack. People usually really want to wouldn't want to build there. Exactly. Right? You know, that's kind of like the niche. That's kind of that's how a lot of these racetracks develop, especially the smaller tracks. And so he was very close. And then there was like a endangered sandfly, the Delphi sandfly. He was going to have to go through this environmental process over a flea, <laughs> you know, in the nineties. Um, it's it's like I'm doing you guys stuff. a favor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like <laughs> fleas or carters. Like yeah. what's more important. You know what I mean? So, uh, it's, it's totally stupid, but that's, that's our state. That's California. They're, they get, they're not very pro development. They're not very pro business when it comes to those issues. And so, um, it got shot down. And he reached out, ironically, to a Leland Associates agent. That's that's the company that I work with now um, here in the Inland Empire, a Leland Associates guy out of Riverside. And he said, hey, Rocky, there's actually a city. Uh, it's called the city of Beaumont, kind of a little, little discreet town off of the freeway. It's a growing town um, that is very business friendly, very, very much open to things like this. They have a motocross track. They have an RC track. They'd probably go for a kart track. 
and you'd, you'd probably find out pretty quickly whether they'd say yes or no. Because my dad was just running into roadblocks in most of these cities around here, even, even back then. And so um, they went there and they got some initial support and they said, you know, tie up a piece of land and show us a design and apply for a conditional use permit. Uh, and for recreation, you got to switch the zoning of the land temporarily or get a condition that will allow you to use the land for a different use. And so uh, he found a, a, we found a perfect piece of land, laid out the track. We were all pumped up. And then Lowe's came in and bought the land out from underneath us. And we were like so depressed, so oh, bummed wow. out. And the city actually told our real estate agent, hey, go a little bit further down the street. Instead of having this 12-acre site that you guys thought would be perfect for a racetrack, there's a 30-acre site down the street. And at the time, I hadn't really put together how much land I needed to do a really good track. But it's really difficult to lay out something special on 12 acres. You need a minimum of 20 and preferably 30. And so, yeah. and that's what we got. We kind of got it and we got it for a very inexpensive price and the city signed off on it. I remember being at the hearing where they were essentially going to approve or disapprove it. And uh, we had a lot of members of, of the carding community there. Like the president of Tri-C was there. Don Morbitzer was there to speak on our behalf. Um, and there were, there were, uh, there was opposition that had shown up. I don't know how or why, but there were people that lived in the city of Beaumont that showed up that were like, we don't like racing. And you can hear those, you can hear those damn motors at 8 a.m. in the morning. And all those people showed up and there were four people on the board that had to vote on it. And I think the first was a yes. The second was a no. The third was a yes. And the fourth person, if they were a no and it was a tie, it would default to a no. So they had to say yes or we were done. And, the, and it was like this little lady. And I was like totally sizing her up. I'm like, what's she going to do? Like, this is this is like, you know, the fate of the, of the yeah. remainder of my life is sitting with this lady. And she's like, and, a call for a recess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, she said yes. And I remember walking out of there and be like, oh, my gosh, we're going to do it. Like, we got approved. We, we, we're green lighted for a racetrack. Um, and, and this is, is this late 2001 or where is late, it? probably late 2002, early 03. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so we, uh, we decided, uh, so my, and you're, you're only I'm 20, young. yeah, 22 or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I had just been racing cars primarily and, and, and so my dad was the business drive behind it. He was the financing behind it. He understood how to do it. I was really more of a kind of psychotic perfectionist that wanted to build the best track in the world. You know, like that was my thing is like, if we're going to do this, I want it to just be the greatest track ever. I want to go, I want to like go to the furthest lengths to make sure it's perfect. And so, and he, he supported that. So instead of doing what most tracks do, where you just get a tractor and blade a track and pave it, you know, a lot of cart tracks across America, especially up to that point, were not professionally engineered, designed. They didn't have... Um, they weren't staked and graded and, and paved properly. Um, they, they weren't that well thought out. It was more just follow the natural terrain when you pave it and hopefully it turns out good. Yeah. You know, Let's type of thing. Let's go paint on the ground and slurry it. I mean, who, who does <laughs> <Yeah>. that? <laughs> hey, parking lot's a parking lot. You got, at least you got flexibility here. You can yeah, do a lot right, with it. Right, right. Um, but we wanted to build a permanent outdoor racetrack. We loved karting. We had great memories of karting. And I had actually, in that racing phase where I was doing some of the um, the Atlantic and Barber Dodge stuff, I had come back and just done a few kart races. I'd done the California State Championships at, uh, at Adams, and I went out to this new track in Vegas. At the time, it was called Sloan. was na later on uh, renamed Xplex. Right. Mm. And that was like the first real European-style track I ever drove in a cart. And I put it on the pole. I didn't. I didn't win the race. Ended up crashing out. But IKF. IKF Region Seven. This is before Scoos and all that. This is like 1996, 1997. Um, and I remember thinking, this is the greatest racetrack I've ever been on. Like it, it was so fast and flowing and fun. And up to that point, everything I had driven, there was nothing wrong with it. But places like Adams and Paris and Amago and the places I grew up driving on. They were the tracks that were born out of the 1960s. Right. They had a limited, school, yeah. yeah, limited amount of land, great junior tracks, great places to grow up and learn to cart. But um, there was no way that they could compete with some massive scale like mini F1 track. It just, yeah, right, right, it right. was just not the same thing. So when I drove it, I was like, I told my dad, I'm like, man, if we could ever build something like this, that that was it. So when when I drove Xplex, that was kind of the initial catalyst to us talking about it more and both of us being interested in it. It didn't come about until, you know, really early, uh, early 2003, we got all the approvals. And then, um, 
we did we didn't have an unlimited budget we had a you know we had a, a good budget to do the track right to do the things that mattered right we were never going to be able to build a taj mahal you know huge spectating you know office yeah. area i was it, never there but it looked a little light on green oh yeah it was it was, <laughs> it was desert you know i we actually thought it was going to be green because the the track when we got there the land was all green grass i'm like this worked out perfect oh wow you know like this is just gonna what be. happened well, once you, yeah. it turns out once you grade it all and like you kill the topsoil, it doesn't grow back. At least it didn't there. So it just remained dirt, you know? <laughs> so it's like, whatever. But, um, but we, um, we hired all the right people and I was just really adamant about getting the track design portion of it. Right. So I knew what I liked. I knew what I wanted, but I wanted to get feedback and input from as many people in the car community and the karting community. Oh, cool. Because when I got out of karting, a lot of the guys that I raced against, people like Pat Long, people like Phil Giebler, they went over and raced in Europe and they raced in like world finals, you know, before that was really early on. A lot of people didn't do that back then. Um, so they got to go to tracks like Suzuka, like world class, famous kart tracks. And I, and I, I got my hands on those track layouts, but I wanted to talk to them about what the corners felt like, how fast they really were in different types mm -hmm. of carts. I wanted to build a track that was good for juniors, good for 100cc guys, and fun for shifter guys, something that would kind of check all the boxes. Because yeah, shifter yeah. was really starting to come on pretty yes, strong. exactly, exactly. And get as many opinions as I could from as many people as possible. So I talked to Phil and Pat, I talked to Joey Hand, um, talked to John Marconi. I talked to guys that weren't even necessarily drivers, but had just been to a lot of tracks and got as mm -hmm. many ideas as I could. Cause you really only get a, you get one chance to do it right. Once that pavement goes down, that's right. it. That's like, it yeah. like you don't, you don't want to cut the track up. You don't want to repave it. Like a, it's costly. B it's going to create bumps and, yeah, and, and more issues, longevity issues for the pavement. So you really got to get it right the first time. So we hired a real engineer and I went through probably 70 or 80 different um, versions of the track, just I modifying it. it. And I started with just like a tracing paper and a compass. And I was basically manipulating track widths, um, different radiuses, different deltas, um, really making sure that we had some high speed corners that would just blow you away, have some medium speed corners that would be more technical and then have some slow corners where you really got to stand on the brake. So I didn't want someone to show up and, and say that it was like X plex where it's just all flying fast. Like mm -hmm. I wanted you, I wanted you to be able to slow down a few times. Right. And then I also learned that you got to put elevation in a track. If you want to build something special, no matter how good a layout is, if it's just a flat track, yeah, it misses character, you know, yeah. and you really impart character into a race track when you have elevation and the more elevation, the better, as long as you don't get too carried away with your vertical curves, they've got to be smooth. You know, they can't just be jumps and stuff. It's got to <laughs> yeah. be smooth. Yeah. We so, still have to remember we're only an inch off the ground. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> like, like that's the neat thing about karting. I mean, Moran raceway, people remember it having like a hundred feet of elevation. The track only had about 20 feet of elevation. Um, and in a cart, because you're so low to the ground, that sensation of elevation is magnified on, right. a, on a, you know, exponential scale. So, um, so I was talking to track designers. Uh, we, Sonoma had just been built. Button Willow had just been built. Grand J had just been built. So I went to all those tracks, drove them, measured them, got my I measuring tape I didn't know they were out. all coming around at the same time like yep. that. Oh, yep. wow. There was kind of like a like a birth of tracks at that time. Grand Junction had just been paved. Um, there were other new tracks that were supposedly uh, coming, you know, coming up. Um, and, you know, this place came up uh, a year after it. You know, Cal Speed oh, wow. was around 04-ish, you know. Mm -hmm. So... There was a lot up until that point, you basically had Adams, Paris, and Imago. I mean, Southern California needed a big venue where you could host big events and and we just wanted to go for it. So um, I, I, I got like a mini PhD in asphalt because I wanted to learn about the right mixed designs and make sure we got the right type of asphalt to put down so the track wouldn't delaminate. And, um, and basically it's a curse now because every time I walk across a parking lot, I'm like inspecting it. I'm looking yeah. at the grout. I'm looking at like the, the content of what's in it. it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and getting the curbing right and the straightaway right and all that stuff. So once we had the track designed, it finally got to a point where my dad's like, okay, no more, no more redesigns of the track. Like the, the engineer is about to kill us. Like we're, we own the dirt, the track's rough graded. We got to pave this thing. It had been raining out in Beaumont. So we had been delaying it. Um, he so had fixed expenses. Once the weather turns, it's time to go. Yeah, he had fixed expenses and there was no income coming in. So at some point, you just got to pay the thing and go, right? Yeah. You got to get the doors open. And so uh, I kept refining it as much as we possibly could. 
and uh, finally finally paved it, and I was there the whole entire time. They paved it in about a day and a half. It's crazy how quickly the track goes down. Um, but prior to that, before we had done that, we actually went to the streets of Willow, rented out the skid pad there. Mm-hmm. It'd be just like renting out this parking lot and actually set up every single corner on Moran Ra- on Moran oh, Raceway oh, and the straightaway length before it. And I was in a KT100, which is kind of a good middle of the road cart, and and had data and all that. And basically, you had a decent driver that could, you know, a decent driver that could test it. Uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I, I actually at one point I'd never driven the big uh, like the big part of the track up there. I'm talking about streets of Willow. Right. There was a newer part that they had done up there and I just took off the track. I don't even know if it was open. I just took off and started hitting all those corners. I was having the time of my life. It was fun. That, that <laughs> track's fun. We need to have some cart races there. You go dad. Um, I got one more revision. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I just left the track, but, um, but the, uh, it, it was very good to do that because I wanted to make sure in my mind, everything we laid out was at least really close. And, and in reality, when you drive it, I wanted to make sure it's really close. Cause even on a racetrack, you guys know if you manipulate, like when you guys are out here on a race weekend, if you manipulate an apex barrier or an exit barrier by four or five feet, hundred percent, what that does to the speed, the corner speed, what that does to the racing, yep, it changes, every, it changes yeah. everything. Yeah. And we just take one of the corners up here. I mean, when to, to kind of go back all the, the, the Sportivo design and the tech, Technico design of the mm-hmm. two that I was involved in uh, when we first, uh, you know, before I got here, we didn't have any other track designs. And then obviously we redid the top. And ironically, I also talked to, to like Phil Giebler and a few others. Yep. Of if I was going to change it, what would you change? Mm-hmm. You know? Um, but yeah, I mean, the nice thing for me is it's, it's all paved. Yes. So I can just, I'd move a cone or move this or whatever, and I can just try it, try it, try it. And I had uh, the Musgraves out here with their shifters. Yes. Because I was thinking... I got the slow stuff handled. I don't do, I don't drive shifters. So if I can figure out the fast stuff and moving cones around, shit like that, going back to what you just said about you move barriers and it happens all the time Mm -hmm. when we go clockwise around here, up here in turn four, we have, the way I designed it is the barriers are a good five or so feet off of quote track edge where the paint is. They get blown out, and then then you know everybody's like, "You got to move the barriers out of the way, move the barriers." Well, then you can't freaking pass in the corner anymore because yes. we're not slowing down. Exactly. Yeah. Well, it's like no exactly. matter how far you move it out, they're going to keep going faster. They're going to find a new way to hit it. It and completely it. changes the flow of the track. Yeah. And a lot yeah. of people don't. I mean, even making your track twenty six feet versus twenty eight feet versus thirty feet, it yep. changes everything. Exactly. And so, so does the radius of the corners. It changes everything. Yeah. So, at the time, it was getting trendy to. Um, to build tracks at like 30, 31 feet. We actually built Moran Raceway at 28 feet, and I'm happy we did. I think it's the perfect width because at a certain point when you go so wide with a track design, you can't make the radiuses small enough. Um, so so the radiuses end up being like a cone almost. You know what I mean? They're not like a rounded. You don't have like a long curb that yeah. you can apex up on. So there's just a lot that I learned going through it. Um, I think we, you know, for the, uh, the, I probably would change a couple little things about Moran Raceway, but by and large it was really well received people fell in love with it i fell in love with it that's what i've always heard it was so much fun it it just turned out really really good and the juniors loved it the shifter guys loved it a lot i still get every time i go to a track with rocky now i get people that walk up and i think part of it is is that it got bulldozed so it's like it's like elvis presley you know like it it becomes a once you're gone your legend grows right and so (laughs) ran race we got bulldozed so i think that like just from an emotional perspective people are like so broken hearted that their favorite track is gone and it makes it yeah. even better than it was. But, uh, it was a cool track. We had a lot of good, uh, memories there. A lot of good races. Uh, my dad and I are racers. We built it for racers. We thought, uh, we were naive. We thought that we could open it and there would be enough revenue off of racers alone to have a profitable business. We didn't have a fleet of carts. We didn't do corporate events. We weren't particularly interested in that. We we're just like, all we're going to do is just races all the time and open yeah. practice. And then we realized we're like, okay, Monday through Friday, there's really only like 10 people practicing out here. There's not enough revenue to support this place. So we better get a fleet of carts. We better start getting into the corporate entertainment and the arrive and drives and, and the racing school, which ended up being great. And um, your dad was doing real estate at that time. So did exactly. you become essentially full-time uh, aside yeah. from the racing, the car yeah. stuff, full-time employee. The car even, track was your thing. Even yeah. his real estate development tapered back, and that running Moran Raceway, that was pretty much you know him and I's full-time deal. And it was gotcha. so cool for us to do it together. Um, you know, my my favorite memories would be like he'd 
bring the motorhome out to the track. I'd sleep in it like the night before a big race and wake up at my own racetrack to go race. I'm like, this is the coolest thing ever. Like, so I, you did get a chance to go karting again once Moran was was yeah, a thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The first year we were so busy that I wasn't able to race a lot. Yeah, and then um, and then anytime there was a big race that would come to the track, even though I wasn't on a, I wasn't running the Scusa Promoter Tour, I wasn't doing Stars, I wasn't doing a lot of travel races. I would run a couple races here and there. I would try to run as many Moran Raceway races as I could because I loved the track, had a home court advantage, had my cart dialed in there. Part of the problem for me is as I got older, um, I kept growing. So when I got out of karting at 14, 15 years old, I was 145 pounds, you know, five foot nine, something like that. And then when I came back to karting as a, as a full grown man, I was, you know, 185, six feet. And quickly realize it's not quite as easy to get the chassis to work as it <laughs> yeah. was when I was little. And the, and usually if you're lighter, you're on the smaller end of the spectrum as a driver, that's to your advantage because that's what the carts are designed around. So right. I was always overstuck, always over bicycling, always super fast uh, on Friday when the track was low grip. And then the more rubber that would go down, the more it would work against me. My cart would, would get bound up. Yeah. So I'd be talking to people like Travis Irving or Darren Elliott, the big guys that were fast. I'm like, what do we got to do? And they're like, you got to slam the seat and you got to put this axle in. You got to take mm-hmm. the caster out and you got to do all this stuff. So, so I, you know, I had a good baseline setup for whatever cart I was driving at Moran Raceway. Um, I knew the place well and just love racing it. So I, I definitely got to compete in a lot of big races there. When you were talking about you know making the business work though, and you know you get a chance to go out there and play is is obviously a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's not necessarily how the business part works. Uh, when you guys were first doing it, did you think about all right, we got to start our own club, mm-hmm. or we need to get a club here? And then how did you and what did you acquire when you started doing the arrive and drive stuff? Yeah, so we never really had any ambition to have a racing series of our own because we recognized it was it, it was its own uh, business model. You know, if you're going to become a race promoter, uh, it's completely separate from owning a racetrack. Not that you can't do it. I mean, plenty of t- track owners ha- have done it, and you have a captive audience, and we could have done it. But at the time, we had so many clubs that wanted to race with us. We had tri C, we had SoCal, we had San, Di- San Diego Kart Club, we had Scusa Pro Kart, we had Scusa Pro Tour, we had Stars of Karting, we had Andy Seisman's Gator Z Series. IKF. We had IKF, we had the Grand Nationals, um, we had a lot, of, even a lot of kind of one-off events. Rob Niles uh, came out and ran his endurance races there. Right. So we probably were hosting uh, maybe 20 to 22 weekends a year races, which is a lot of racing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we had open practice going. And unfortunately, it wasn't enough to make the business model pencil. So uh, we reached out to Empire Carts at the time, the Barrows family, this okay. is before uh, Frank took it over. And we partnered with them and they donated 10 race carts. They were actually not school carts. They're just full on top cart race carts with HPVs on them. Wow. And we turned them into a racing school. Those were our racing school carts. Okay. So, cool. um, so we got containers out there and we hired uh, Nathan Thibodeau. Yeah. We hired uh, uh, Frank, Fran- Francois Duran, um, both of those guys. Um, ev- everyone at Moran Raceway found us. We never took out an ad. They all just walked in uh, as we opened up the track and they're like, we want to work here. And we're like, cool. We hit it off. We never fired anyone. They stayed with us the entire time. So we have amazing memories with our employees. Um, the, the guys that worked there were great guys. The guys that ran the track were great guys. And my dad and I were really involved. The first year we were out there six days a week. We were taking out the trash. We were draining the ponds. Um, there's like pictures of my dad and his boxers, you know, draining the pond <laughs> out in the middle of turn two, yeah. taking out trash. And there are people who are like, come up to him they're like so this is what what happens to uh to ex indie car drivers they oh, man. taking out the trash <laughs> at the racetrack he's like yep that's exactly what happens to him you know oh, man. um so we can get you out here if that's what you yeah, want to do. exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> trust me we've done enough track maintenance days i've hung around the racetrack enough you know oh, and man. so there was a lot that went into it just keeping it manicured just keeping the weeds down repainting the curbs keeping the track in tip-top shape we would have the track grinded um, just maintaining that place, maintaining 30 acres of land was a full-time job. Um, running all those corporate events was a lot of work. And, you know, we got to a point where we would have tour buses and 60 to a hundred people show up, you know, big companies yeah, like buddy. T-Mobile, you've been there, you've d- you guys have done a lot more of it than we did, but we were starting to dabble in that. We had a strong Google AdWords campaign. We were doing everything we could to get, get the, the corporate going. And we were doing it with carts that really were not reliable. They were full on race cars, oh, yeah. Yeah. but that's why people liked it. People would come out there 
and they'd be like, holy crap. They get that experience. And we would let them run the full track. We would never run a shorter version of the track. So we would get, take people who had never been exposed to karting and and literally they would uh, fall in love with it. They're like, these carts are flying. And it, you know, I mean, it was somewhat, I guess you could say, irresponsible. No one ever got hurt. But I mean, they were flying. <laughs> they were going fast. And, and so we would actually... Throw somebody straight into uh, KB or HPV or whatever right out of the gate. Yes. Good luck. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. In our classes, our curriculum that we came up with, um, we really tried to instill some healthy fear into people because we were trying to let them know, like, look, if you're the guy that goes out and tries to be a hero in the first session, you're going to scare yourself. You're better off to, you know, to slow down, to build up slowly, build confidence, slow in, fast out. Right. Don't mm -hmm. don't charge the corners, all of, all of that kind of stuff. And then we closed with making sure they understood they were responsible for crash damage. And we quoted some prices and stuff. And that, that usually we keep them at bay. Yeah, we get yeah. like crazy bachelor parties where they would tear stuff up or we get like real race teams that would come out there with the mechanics and they would off road the carts. And mm -hmm. they'd have like a three thousand dollar bill that they were totally cool with. And we're like, all right, you know, I guess it's a win win yeah. for everyone involved. Yeah. You know, <laughs> we've had people go, hey, you could you should do a mechanics race or something like that with, with our carts. I'm like, there's no way in hell I'm saying yes to that because <laughs> exactly. yeah, they're just going to get destroyed. Exactly. Yeah, you know, that's there's no way I can't imagine. Imagine yeah. doing it with race carts, though. I know, wow. I know, and so it took a lot of work to keep those things going. We had a welding shop down the street that would keep those those chassis intact, but that's what we ran for four or five years. Um, that was probably sixty percent of our business. The balance was what I would call the racers, all the race events and the open practice, and um, it really was a short run. I mean, we really were only there for about four and a half years, right? But we had some of the biggest races in the country. We had a lot of guys like Alexander Rossi won won a Duffy there at 13 years old. He, he went on to win oh, 8500. Yeah. Uh, Connor Daly uh, raced there. Um, you know, uh, Graham Rahal raced there. Alex Speed raced there. Jason Bowles. Um, I mean, I could go on and on forever. So so many guys that went on to cars, sports car racers, kids that were nine years old at the time that I was watching that are now like winning Le Mans, you know, like Gustavo Mineta's types of like so the, cool types of people. So, um, you know, it's just it's cool because racing's a family uh, in the car community and in the karting community. And everywhere we go, we always get a shout out. We always get a pat on the back. People That's ask cool. us, are you going to do another one? Um, which we would love to do, but it, I don't think it's in the cars. I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah. Um, so yeah, some of the, some of the best memories of my life. I mean, in all honesty, I actually, uh, up until maybe a year ago had, have had reoccurring dreams and I don't have reoccurring dreams about anything. I, I have had reoccurring dreams that I'm at Moran Raceway and somehow Moran Raceway is still open <laughs> and, and there's certain things that are going on. There's a race or, or I'm talking to one of my guys there and uh, and then I wake up. I'm like, crap! It's it's definitely not there. It's it's been bulldozed. It's, yeah. it's gone. Oh, you know, man. but it, it it's like right down there it's like there. hard hardwired in my mind. You know, <laughs> so many good times. What uh, what was the what was the eventual end uh, mm -hmm. of Moran? And and it kind of sounded like it wasn't according to the original plan there. Yeah, exactly. So we had a 20 year conditional use permit, and we planned on being there honestly for at least 15 or 20 years for the long haul. And it was our field of dreams because it was a profitable business. Um, we loved doing it. Uh, I was out there in my mid twenties racing. I mean, I couldn't ask for any more. It was the coolest job in the universe. Right. And, um, and what happened was, is there was a lot of pressure on industrial zone land at the time. It was 2005, 2006, the economy was going bananas before right, the big right. crash. And we started to have a lot of these big institutional developers knocking on our door and saying, Hey, we want to put industrial warehouse, a big industrial warehouse on this land. And we're like, ah, we're not ready. We've only been here for a couple of years. One day, you know, uh, we'll do that. And, um, within a short amount of time, maybe two and a half years of us opening the track, we got multiple offers. There was a bidding war occurring, uh, with these developers on our land to build an industrial warehouse. Cause that's what the underlying zoning supported. And it got to a point where we couldn't say no, because the offer was maybe, I don't know, it was probably 10 times more than, yeah, about 10 times what we paid for the land. Wow. And so like if you bought a house for 500 grand and somebody told you, you can sell it for $5 million, two years later, at a certain point, no matter how much you love the house, you're like, I, I got to sell it. Like yeah. I would be a fool not to. Right. Exactly. Right. So that's yeah. what, that's basically what happened. Um, and we were very upset about it, but we're like, you know what, maybe we can do another track. You know, maybe we can mm -hmm. parlay this into another track somewhere else. And we got to do it financially. It's a no brainer. So a, a developer named Trammell Crow bought it. Um, they had the intention of building a, a b building these warehouses on it. And they called us up one day and they're like, you know what? We're not going to build them. So we'll just go ahead and let you lease back from us. And they gave us a very, very inexpensive lease back rate. 
And we were able, because they closed escrow sometime in 05, we were able to stay there all the way to basically January 2008, January 1, 2008. We were there. And so we got to lease back uh, without any mortgage on the property with much lower overhead. Wow. Um, knowing we, we weren't going to have to invest any more into the track. We weren't going to build permanent right. restrooms or lights or anything like that because it, it had already been sold. The, yeah. The, yeah. the handwriting was on the wall. They were going to call us one day. It was a month to month lease. And we thought the month to month lease would be like, you know, literally maybe it would turn into a 90 day deal. Well, it turned into another two and a half years of running it. And by that point, we had gone into the Great Recession. Everybody knew it. Right. Like the bubble yeah. had popped, the subprime mortgage meltdown had already began. And it was Q407. Everybody knew crap was hitting the fan. And we're like, okay, now it's actually awesome because we sold the track, we cashed out. And there's no way these guys would ever be dumb enough to, to build do this. It now. It would, this would be the worst time to yeah. build 600,000 square feet of buildings. Well, Trammell Crow flipped it to another really aggressive uh, REIT. Uh, developer, and they got paid to build the building essentially whether it was profitable or not. That was their incentive was just to build it. Oh. So when they flipped it, when they when they you know flipped the real estate to this new group, they called us up and they're like, we're going to build it. And we were like in shock. We're like, holy crap. There's no actually, way. Yeah, like yeah. why would you do this? This makes no financial sense until you you realize for them it did make financial sense. So right. so they, uh, they, they said, hey, here's your notice. You're out. Um, our last day, my dad and I were still there working on carts. Uh, we were a little bit shorthanded. We were, we were doing schools and stuff or like get, making money doing cart rentals. That was the last day. And I showed up a couple days later after they had bulldozed the track and they didn't fully bulldoze it thankfully they just run like a tractor through a couple straightaways to make sure no one could actually drive the track right um and i i got a couple chunks of like the start finish oh, line cool. as, oh, cool. like, yeah. as like something to save like a souvenir and um they they went vertical with those buildings and i got into commercial real estate like i said that that uh spring and that fall, I actually went to the open house because that was in my market. Beaumont was in my market. I went to the open house for this new building. So in like September of 2008. They hauled um, ass. They, yeah, they, they cranked that thing out. Beaumont was super, super flexible with allowing guys to get stuff out of the ground at that time. I went to the open house and I remember sitting in, in this beautiful 600,000 square foot warehouse and looking around, I'm like, this was Moran Raceway like nine months ago. This is so yeah. weird. This is so weird. You know, wow. this is what happens to too many tracks. And right. um, and that building sat vacant for several years. Several years it sat vacant. Um, they couldn't give that thing away. And ultimately, at, at this point today, in 2021, if you drive by it, Amazon is now in the building. Um, mm. That's who it ended up going to at some point in more recent years. It had a couple other tenants in it. So yeah, bummed out. Um, and the economy took such a shot that we realized, okay, the carting model is a difficult model. It's a tough business model because you're expending so much capital to build a racetrack and, and the return isn't as strong as many other business. If you, if you were to take $2 million and invest it in a business, there's many other businesses that, that you can invest that in and get a better return. Oh yeah. We were doing it, not necessarily to get rich. We were just doing it because we loved racing. It's a passion you know, project. Like, yeah. like him and I just loved it. We absolutely loved it. But to really do it right, you really need to have a cart shop and you got to have a really large fleet of, of carts like you guys have that are workhorse carts. We never had that. Right. There were so many mm -hmm. things we did, we never got to, you know, we never got around to doing, we were just there really for the racing. So, um, I was at a crossroads, had to make a decision. Real estate was less appealing to me, you know, from a fun factor perspective, but more appealing from a longevity you well, know, and you had a you had a bit of a link there with your dad and whatnot, and the different things that you yeah. had known, you know, and being drugged to those those meetings, and whatnot. You get a chance to exactly, you know, well, I guess I'll do that, and yes. and you kind of were forced to do it exactly, you know, whether That's you exactly liked it or right. not. You had your your driving career and your cart track all kind of tapering all yes. about the same damn time. It's yeah. exactly right. And, That's exactly right. And now, if we fast forward to where you're at. And, you know, in life and whatnot, we're, you know, see 12, 12 ish years later. Mm -hmm. Now you get a little, a little munchkin. Exactly. Who's, you can live vicariously almost a little yes. bit. Yes. Yes. At, at what point does, does Junior come around and, and he starts running and you kind of get back into that? Cause I, it sounds like you, once Moran's done, you're not carding anymore. Yes. That's you're not, exactly right. And so when do you get back to the carding table? Uh, I didn't really ever 
have any utility for carding. I love carding, but at this point, I'm bigger now. Um, I'm heavier. It's harder to be fast in a cart. Bourbon's really yeah. good. <laughs> bourbon yeah. hadn't hadn't gotten to bourbon yet, but it was in my future. <laughs> um, but but basically, uh, you know, I was so tied up with real estate. Um, I ran the Super Nats in 05, 06, okay. 07, 08. Won won a heat at the Super Nats and Tag Senior. Um, right you know, at the tail well, end of the Moran days. Then. Exactly. Yeah. So during the Moran, the Moran era, I went and ran the Super Nats. I actually designed the track for Tom um, oh, a neat. few of those years and got CIK approval for his first CIK approved just, track. Yeah. That's why he did well. He, yeah. he already had, he had, he had <laughs> yeah. to leg up. There, hey, there was a little bit of incentive in there for me. I'm like, if I get to lay out the track, I'm building corners I like. Nice. You know what I mean? There you go. Not corners my competition likes. <laughs> so I like chicanes. I like high speed corners. I do like hairpins, but um, I prefer faster tracks than slower tracks. That's just, to me it's more fun but um but um had had some good runs there and uh had kind of accomplished whatever i was going to accomplish in karting i'd gotten it all out of my system i did so many laps and ran raceway i used to in the summer in my prime in my mid-20s i drink a couple red bulls a day i would smoke a cigar and i would go jump in a shifter cart and i could drive a shifter cart for an hour straight when it was 110 degrees and literally drain tanks of gas fill it up and just keep going like i was in such good karting shape um and as i mentioned earlier i have a fused spine i had broken my back when i was 21 so karting's never necessarily been the greatest thing for my back because i have a double level fusion my l5 uh l l4 and s1 are all fused together so i was like moran raceway because i felt it was kind of faster and uh longer straightaways a little bit easier on my body than a mm -hmm. slower bumpy i never like going to tracks that just beat the crap out of you in a cart right it's just harder on my back so um so i kind of got it all out of my system and i was getting older i was busy in real estate i'm like i don't really i don't really know how much more carding i'm really gonna have time or, or money or energy to do right now i've got kids and all this stuff I did get a call out of the blue from my dad's teammate, uh, PJ Jones, Parnelli Jones's son, who my dad had won the 24 hours of Daytona with. I got a call out of the blue with him and uh, from him in 2011, sitting in my garage, smoking a cigar, working <laughs> on a real estate contract. And he said, hey, you want to run uh, for Jaguar in the American Le Mans series? And that kind of roped me back into racing a little bit. I got the opportunity to run pretty much the whole season in 2011 in a GT car uh, for the Jaguar RRSR team that was run was by that Jeff the Lossi. black one, black and green car. Yeah, yeah, yep. that thing was quick. Yeah, it was a that good was looking so cool. car. Yeah, yeah, and those cars were all custom made. Um, so, like from the ground up, the motor was hand built, the chassis was hand built. Wow, it wasn't like even based off of a production based car. It was a real race car. Every element of, of it was crafted from nothing. So, cool series, cool car. Um, not a very competitive team at all. But I was teammates with Bruno Jankara. I was teammates with Kenny Wilden. Um, PJ and got to got to run in some great races. Got to run at Laguna and Mossport and Road Atlanta, and and so that kind of for me that that definitely was a better program than karting at the time because I'm like I'm actually getting for the first time in my life I'm getting paid to drive a race car. Right. I'm driving some of the most awesome tracks ever. Way and, better than real estate. Yeah, yeah, yeah way better yeah. than real estate. But I was taking real estate calls like when I was on the grid. I believe I, it. Yeah, I did not yeah. throw in the towel because I wasn't getting paid much to be there. So I was, right. I was doing real estate and racing at the same time. And that's when it occurred to me. I'm like, this is really tough to do both of these yeah. well. Yeah. Because I was like jogging at night, losing weight, back in racing shape um you know had had kind of you know melted off my double chin like i was i was back to where i needed to be but uh but again it, it's just always been difficult to get momentum and racing i was i was quicker than my teammates the two times i was on the track with bruner jankara i was running faster laps than him i ran him down and i've always considered him a really good driver really good benchmark so i was happy with my performance but when that year was over wasn't a good team we didn't win any races it wasn't like uh, Ray Hall's GT team was going to pay me to get in his car, you know? Yeah. So I was back to real estate again, you know? And then I was like, okay, maybe I will do some karting when the opportunity presents itself. But the only time I would go back to a cart is when I wanted to prep for a car opportunity. Uh -huh. And I only had a few car opportunities in my, in my thirties. One was, uh, one was that Jaguar deal. Um, and, and Frank prepped a car, Francis, uh, prepped a car for me down at Adams and I drove it and, and got kind of beat up, but had a good time. And then that IndyCar test that I got, I came out here to Cal Speed, broke my rib. Mm -hmm. That was the beginning of my rib injuries, which has really, really negatively affected my karting. I'd be doing a lot more car racing. It's one thing that my back screwed up, the fact that I broke my rib so many times. That's, yeah. that's kind of like the, the nail in the coffin. But um, 
I came out here, cracked a rib in 2014 before that test. And then, um, in 2000, um, 2017, I had an ATV accident where I went over the bars and my quad ran me over because quads have a tendency to chase you. Mm-hmm. If you've ever crashed on an ATV, I, yes, I have. the thing ran me over and it, and it cracked it's insult to injury is really, like, yeah, it, it actually was the worst the worst break I've ever had because I oh, broke wow. my ribs on the right side, the left side, and the back. Oh, God. so I couldn't sleep well for about uh, four months, and and so it's like I just kept hurting myself. In my thirties, I I broke my wrist twice. Um, I had more injuries in my thirties, just doing crazy stuff, off road cars, accidents, Jeez jumping Louise. sand cars. I was always hurt, and so it never really allowed me to to really get back to karting. Even though I would have loved to, I would have loved to have a reason to get in shape and go do it. Um, and I felt like, okay, Moran Raceway isn't here. That was really my place. I want to wait until there's some elite, you know, awesome place I can go race, which we can get to that a little bit later. I've been working on that with K1 Speed. Right. There right. is going to be an outdoor track coming here to SoCal that's going to be awesome. That that is very close. So, um, so I actually came out and raced against you, Mike, in 2017. I vaguely um, remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I rented a cart. I'm like, this four-stroke thing looks awesome. It reminds me of- It was booming. Uh, yeah, it was booming. It reminds me of the NASCAR stuff I did, right? Where yeah, yeah, yeah. it doesn't look that cool, but when you're in it, it's like exponentially more fun it's a lot than two-stroke racing, right? Yeah, like, yeah. It looks slow and stuff, but you go race that crap, and you're like, this is, <laughs> you gotta be good to do this, right? It was fun. And, and so uh, I, went, I rented a cart from Lloyd Mack on a Saturday, went out, was super quick, you know, like I think I passed. I don't think I ever got passed until the end of the day. You actually passed me. You stuffed me into the hairpin. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't know. I didn't know who you were. And then Lloyd told me, he's like, man, he's like that guy right there. He's the best. He's the man in a oh, four star. To, to beat him, like you're gonna have to be on your A game. And so I think I qualified twelfth the next day. It was wet in the morning. We had a dry setup on the cart. I raced my way up to fourth. And then when I was in fourth, you had checked out. You and you and some other dude had checked out. Right, Mark Connell. Yeah, yeah. Tonight, yeah. I wasn't going to get to you guys. Or maybe John Crow. Might have been John Crow maybe, yeah. at that time. I, I wasn't going to get to you guys, but I was going to get to third. And and uh, and I got dumped going into into this uh, corner over here, Cornicova, and uh, rebroke my ribs again. Oh my, and it was like oh, it was like dude. the fourth time I broke my ribs in my thirties. And every time I just kept taking longer and longer and yeah, longer yeah. to get better. So, um, the, I would say the injuries combined with, uh, some of the car racing combined with my work and then with my son's racing coming along just took me out of commission for yeah, karting. Geez. I just had too much other stuff, too many yeah. other hobbies, too many other interests would have loved to have done more karting. And I probably will. I think when the new K one track comes, I'll, I'll be doing more karting yeah. there. And, so. But you're still able to be, uh, enjoy and be involved with with the kid now. With, 100%. It, how old is he now? So Rocky Jr. is 11. He got into karting about four years ago. Okay. Um, did his first little driving school out of Paris with Dave DeMond. Um, out, out of curiosity, yeah. why the, and this is quote, end quote, late start? Because yeah. you can get going, you know, much, uh, you did, in yeah. fact. So what was That's the- That's a good question. I don't know. I, I think in our mind- you know, like I started at 10 and everything worked out good. So if he was starting at seven, it's like, that's early enough. You know, yeah. there's probably a, there's a point of diminishing returns. And so you guys didn't do kid carts at all. You went- no, no, we did. We oh, did, did you? Yeah, okay. Maybe he was six. I'd have to ask my pops, but, um, but he, he was pretty young. Um, we, uh, we were told that the kid carts don't do a lot for driver development, which is debatable. There's different views on that. Um, I do think it helps for acclimating the kid in the pack it does help with starts, um, with the procedures of racing, right, with the right. line, How and all the day that. Goes. But because they're flat out pretty much everywhere and they never hit a brake pedal, yeah, I can see why some people say skip kid carts, just go straight to micro. Don't you know? put a lot of right. money into it. Exactly. But, but all the things that you said, absolutely, the procedural stuff, like understanding what a race day is, yes. blah, 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 being yes. around other kids. Overall, yeah. it's better to yeah. do it. I think, yeah. I yeah. think it's better. So it's we, more pros. We, yeah, we did it. We did it, and um, and he did great, and we moved up to micro. He did very well, um, up to mini. Um, he finally got his first big win uh, this year at Andy's race here. I remember and, that. Yeah, that was huge. And that was awesome. He 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 beat some really quick kids. To, and I to love get that how win. enthusiastic he is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you look at the uh, the video. Sean Beard does a video with. I want to say he got pole. 
was he the did. first thing. Yeah. He was so <laughs> so stoked in that video. You can go back. He won't throw it up on the on the the full cast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Be he's was, an animated awesome kid. It's you know? awesome. So it's fun because my like I said earlier, my dad's the ultimate racer. He lives and breathes racing. He's the mechanic. I I do not have the mechanical gift. I have no expertise in that area. Are you the manager? Uh, I, I'm the driver coach. <laughs> uh, I and I, you could call me the engineer. I do a lot of the setup stuff. My uh -huh. dad and I do that together. But my dad preps the cart. My dad loves doing it. He's going to do it until his body gives out. So he's a hard charger. Mm -hmm. um, he's got the carts at his house and um, and preps them for all the races. And we've got you know Wulcher Motors. We we pit most of the time with Ryan Perry. We've we've also uh, pitted with DMG over the years, and and primarily race here at Cal Speed. And Rocky's learned a lot here. This track's obviously unique. Uh, it's kind of a unicorn of a racetrack. So a lot of kids that do well here don't necessarily do well at other tracks because they're just it's a different type of place. Right. But a lot of the other people that come to this track that are the fastest kids in the country get waxed because this place is way more technical than it looks. Yeah, a lot of a lot goes into understanding this place. So. Um, so he's, he's developed nicely, you know, I think, uh, he was, he finished third in the championship in LAKC last year. Um, you know, he's, he's probably in the fight to win the championship this year. Um, and we're just having a blast. I mean, we don't have the time and budget to go full, full effort, you know, full national tour. Um, it's a big commitment to do that these days, yeah. to be in Florida, to be yeah. in Indy up to this point, we've pretty much stayed regional we've raced here we've raced the pro car challenge uh we've done some of andy's series those are all fun easy races to do they're relatively local mm -hmm. you're not flying across the country to go to those races you're getting to experience some different tracks and they're all still so super competitive exactly yeah. exactly really deep fields um we had a blast running andy's series this year um and then we actually just did our first ever national event uh i don't know what it was three weeks ago or whatever we were we went to utah utah nice that's the first and first that's a track race. that's a little bit closer to to your heart as far as the way it's the designed. speed is yeah. you read my mind you read my mind so i actually when i when i got there um and i walked up the pit lane and i looked at the track and i saw what was going on i actually walked up to a couple of my old racing buddies um you know guys like travis irving and matt johnson and, and those guys i'm like I got to race here like that. I, I need yeah. to be here. Like I need to be a part of this. This track is insane. You know, like this is what I like, you know, this is my style. So, um, you know, I was looking at it and if you see a guy like Billy Cleveland in his sixties, it still runs that good. That's yeah. inspirational, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Anybody can do it. If you want it bad enough, you just exactly. gotta, you gotta put in the time and effort to do it. So get, get one of the Stilo rib vests for yourself. Get yeah. I need some tips from you on the right rib vest. <laughs> I need, that's probably the number one thing. Dude, I, need to figure I, out. I hurt mine this year and I got that rib vest and that, that's been magical. Okay. Yeah. It, I, I haven't tried that one. That's the way to go. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I hit my, I hurt my ribs years ago in a, in a, uh, street course crash brake failure. Um, and like you said, takes forever to come back. And I, yeah. I probably wasn't right where I'm like, Oh wow. My shit doesn't hurt anymore mm -hmm. for probably like 18 months. It was not, it's ridiculous. Yeah. It was not good. And yeah. it was both sides. Like you had said, yeah, the cartilage tore and I got floating ribs and junk like that. Yeah. But, being in a cart as long, I don't actually wear a rib vest at all. I do the the zoom bang shirt. Okay. Yeah, but again, interesting in a go kart constantly. Yes. There's not as where you would get in a go kart from time to time to be sharp. Yep. You don't need oh my god strong rib muscles etc in a car. So it's, it doesn't surprise me a whole yep. heck of a lot that when you would try to go out on a technical course, one that's bumpy, that you get that yes. bump wrong. Yeah, yeah, it's funny you say that because that's exactly what I noticed. When I was karting in the Moran Raceway days, I was in a kart so much, I never broke a rib one time. Never. Yeah, right. And I, and I had some huge shunts and long runs and bumpy tracks. And yeah, I, I'd be a little bit sore, but never had an injury. Never yep. one time. And I think it's because I was living in a go-kart. Yep. And then I'm out of it for a few years. I get in, I get in a kart one day second session my rib cracks and it's like okay obviously there's something i don't know what the science is behind it but your your ribs will toughen up at yeah. a certain point if you do it enough it's you know? like that muscle memory or whatever right yep. like everything else your body starts going oh so this is what we're going to be doing like you know the, the yes. when you go out we talked about this in a previous episode before morning warm-up yep is the worst like your body yep. is having a way like okay okay we're carding yeah. today it's in shock holy yeah. shnikes you yes know? everything kind of hurts a little soreness and then every, it's cool after that yeah you're as the fine. day goes on yeah. your body loosens up you mm -hmm. get in the groove yep that's how it is and for me it's always been magnified because it's harder to get a cart to stay free especially as the track rubbers up so if i'm on a bumpy track heavy rubber there's a higher likelihood that my cart's going to start 
bicycling, yeah. hopping, bouncing. Yeah. That's what really takes the wind out for me. Absolutely. You know? so, yeah, and this this place is exactly like that. I mean, shit, yes. this is last weekend at Tracy. There's a picture that uh, Derek's girlfriend Heather got of me, and I'm and I'm on too. Yes. And I don't even remember it being on too at, <laughs> at any point, but it doesn't surprise me. I'm the king of bicycling go-karts. I, I can make one flip over, you yeah. know, just driving it through a corner without doing anything well, crazy. You, you said you're about six foot. Yep. But it looks like most of your height is from your butt up. Yep. You know, yep. Like most mine's in my legs. So yes. you got a lot of weight hanging up it's just on a the lever. Top. It's just yeah. a lever. Yeah. If you look at the way go-karts are designed and the way that they jack weight and the fact that there's a fixed axle and no differential, um, you know, and the way that the tire works, like it really is not good to be big and heavy. It's not nope. a good program. Yeah, you don't no. see too many big dudes running fast. They're yeah. at a certain there's so point, much extra tuning you got to do for that taller driver. Yeah, yeah. yeah maybe on a wet track or really low grip track, there's a big. The big guy has the advantage, but in ninety percent of cases, you're not there. Yeah. And it's better if I could shrink myself down. I would. Yeah, I'm would. trying to beat Brett Harrelson, who's like up to my shoulder, whatever, and tiny, and he's sliding the car around and, and still then he fast gets as hell. even shorter in the seat. Like, <laughs> isn't yeah. that funny how that works? God. God Man. dang it. Like old Matty yeah. J out there. He tucks. I'm like, Matt, why are you tucking? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. you're, you're already below the fairing, but yeah. you got the hot dog fairing that already covers your head, man. Relax. It's crazy. Yeah. So barring the, the ribs and whatnot, mm-hmm. you getting back in the seat, it's really about making sure it, it doesn't, it doesn't adversely affect the, the time and money game that you got going on with the munchkin. But yep. if you were going to get back into it, what, what do you think you might want to go play in? I like KA. Yeah. Uh, I bought a KA motor. Um, and intended to race with it, uh, bought the wrong cart, um, injured my ribs, had to sell that cart, still have the motor. So, you know, I saw my old buddy, Steven Barros won the super Nats a couple years ago. In yeah. KA, and that was kind of like inspiration. I'm like, okay, that, that looks fun. I would I'd love, love to do it. It's, so, it's so much fun. So dude. Yeah. It's, fun. it's yeah. such a good time. It seems like a cool class because ultimately, um, like a 125 tag cart, it's quick. It's it's probably you could argue more fun for if you're just driving around by yourself because it's got that hit. I mean, it's got a, it's a pretty fast package, uh, but you got you know the water cooled feature. You got more moving parts. You have more expenses. Um, you know, it's a little bit less racy, a little bit more single file. The KA reminds me more of a reliable, simplified uh, HPV. You know, from back in the day where you push a button, you go. Um, it's got enough power to be fast and fun, but if you screw up, you pay the penalty for it and right, kind of right. bog off the corner Yeah, and, and it's more affordable than some of these other classes. So I think that's why we're seeing a lot of growth there. Um, so that, that's probably where I would go. I think when this new K went that for whatever reason, Cal speed beats me up. I don't know what it is, but I, she's I've, got some bumps to her. Yeah, yeah. I've broken my ribs out here a few times and I think there's a lot of these corners are longer duration corners and they're longer than 180 degrees or yeah. some of them are, if you're running Contino backwards, you're in it for a long yeah. time. So actually, um, Chris Werheim was just out here practicing this last weekend yeah. and I'm like, Hey, you going to race tomorrow? He goes, no, I'm just not in, not in race shape or whatever. He goes, if it was at a different track, I might, I'm like, well, what do you mean? He goes. He goes, I can I can take a few sessions. He goes, but the longer, faster corners, that's what's wearing me yes. out. You know, just yeah. the G's up on the seat and stuff. I'm Which there. is that ironic because that's yep. the kind of corners it sounds like you're you – Yeah, I, I actually have a lot of fun. Some of these corners here are really fun. Like that big carousel is a blast. I yeah. love uh, the chicane section here. Um, you know, the track has, has good, fast, high speed flow. It's just for whatever reason, this place grips up and where the, where some of these little ripple bumps are on the yeah. corners. Once I get, even, even when I was racing that four stroke, I was able to kind of load it up. I'm just a big, a big dude and it, the car doesn't handle as good. That's the bottom right. line. So <laughs> I think if it's at a higher flowing track where I can pull some caster out and lay the seat down, I, it, it's, it's to my advantage. So, yeah. um, well, so and, I'll get and there. And you, and you are the one. If correct me if I'm wrong, that's designing the K1. Yes. Track. So here we go once again. Leg exactly. up. There you You're go. Already yeah, in yeah. There. I'm trying. I'm trying to give myself a little leg up here, boys. We'll see. Yeah. If you know what? Else, just to be able to go out there and drive. I actually feel bad for track owners because there's always this thing like they have this advantage that no one else does. I'm sure Troy Adams got it growing up and some of these other guys. The truth is, um, there's a diminishing point of returns on yes. that. Like fast drivers, they end up fast everywhere, yeah. right? So yeah. even if you have hometown advantage at your track. Um, the guys that are really good, they all get there. They yeah. figure out their carts. They figure out the line. You're yeah. like, okay, I, I don't really, at this point, I'm just going to have to duke it out. You I've, know? Right. I've gotten a bit of crap about, you know, being just a Cal Speed guy or what. Yes. Rob Howden, he, he got me, oh, it, it hurt. Yeah. But he, he got me at, at Phoenix. He goes, 
He goes, Cal Speed, Phoenix Slow. That's <laughs> oh, oh, that's I, what a like, jerk. Oh, <laughs> I'm like, I got pull. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, it's it it can be tough though. But like you said, like people go, oh, you got all these laps here, Mike. You're track advantage. I'm like. You're the one out here winning all the bloody races in the yes. same damn class. It's like you're going to be fine. Everybody, yes. it's, it's a, such a tight group, and like you said, the hundred cc stuff has really turned into a little bit less work, maybe even more fun. The yes. only the yeah. only time that I've heard people like eh, I don't know if I want to do it are people who just they want to go fast. Mm-hmm. They want to go as fast as they possibly can, and obviously, you know, having the softer tire sometimes is is yep. also kind of nice. But yeah, for sure, the the, the hard hundred cc game and you know, track advantage. I think in this case, it's going to be more about you being able to cut laps, have fun, that kind of deal. Yeah. Yeah. I think good drivers, they learn tracks quickly. You know, yeah. you get up to speed, you know, I'm sure within a half a day, you've reached your potential at most of these places on fine tuning on the line. And then from there, you're just fine tuning yeah. little stuff, little stuff in the data, little stuff with your cart. Yeah. So, um, it's not rocket science, but I, I am excited about the new track. Um, the K one track that's going to be coming. It's not fully my story to tell because it's not my track. It's, you know, the owner, David Danglard, it's his deal. Yeah. Um, but I can say it's going to be very similar to Moran Raceway from the perspective that it'll be over a mile long, 28 feet, exact same curbs. It's going to have similar types of corners arranged in a different sequence. It's going to have even more elevation than Moran Raceway. He's got 50 acres of land. Um, it's, you know, about 20 minutes down the road from where the former Moran Raceway location was. So great location for Southern California. I think the track will be turnkey ready to go a hundred percent within the next six months to a year, maybe, wow. maybe sooner than that. So, um, I assume they've broken ground then already. I, I haven't gotten the latest update from him. He was delayed from COVID. He was ready to do it. Gotcha. Um, oh, wow. And COVID just slowed things down. But now he's got all of his indoor centers open. It's mm-hmm. it's happening. It's yeah. 100% happening. Yeah. Um, I would not have had the confidence level to say that six months ago. And it's it's funny. I found him. I brokered the land on the real estate side. Uh, on, the, on the real estate side, I found him the dirt. Back in 2014, it was a three and a half year escrow to get him closed. He closed on it in 2017. Um, the site's located in Riverside County, so he had to hire um, basically politicians to cut through all the red tape to get the thing permitted. Um, had to go through all kinds of uh, environmental uh, issues, tribal issues um, to get the thing permitted. And he's going to do what we did, uh, but he has the budget for all the finishing touches. So it'll have garages. It'll have a spectating lounge. It'll have a similar setup that you see to his indoor circuits where there's like entertainment and arcades and drinks and a restaurant. And it'll be like a full on European style setup. So, um, I'm pumped up for Southern California. Whenever that does finally happen, uh, it's going to be really cool. And the track, I'm just, I'm a racer. I just want to go race the track. That's the bottom line. So I'm going to be involved in making sure he has the right, um, paving crew and, and the right mix design with the asphalt. You could use that PhD, huh? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's a mini PhD. (laughs) I don't really have a PhD in asphalt for anyone that was taking me seriously on that. That was sarcastic, but I know more about asphalt than I care to know. (laughs) So uh, between between the real estate side yeah. of PhD, <laughs> mini PhD, yeah. and the uh, and the track design stuff, it's definitely uh, kind of going to be a fun little side project for you for sure. Yeah, it will, it will, and I'll be I'm excited for Rocky to race there. Uh, Rocky's regret, and he has so many people come up to my dad and I and talk about Moran Raceway. You know, he was born a year after Moran Raceway closed, so he's heard so much about it, right. and so many stories, and people go into like these in-depth analysis of each corner and he's just sitting there looking at him. He's like, man, how did I never get to go to this yeah. place? Way you to know? go, dad. I know, I know. <laughs> so he's always said he wants to build a track one day. So maybe later on in life, That's if the budget neat. allows for it, we could find something. Maybe we would do it. But I've always said I would basically need to, to win the lotto for, for it to happen again. Yeah, for right. you to not actually have to worry about the financial side of stuff. Yes, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. I think that the right types of people to build Outdoor cart tracks, for the most part, if you look at how expensive land is in Southern California now, it, it's it's better suited for an extremely high net worth person that happens to love racing, you know, like right. uh, or, or an IndyCar dynasty team like the Andretti's could do an awesome if they were California people. I'm sure that they could find a way to pull yeah. it off and a city would love to see the Andretti name. Right. I'm using them as an example. There's many other people that could do it, but. Um, there aren't a lot of just average Joe guys at the go-kart track that can pull it off. It's just a, it, what we went through with K1 to get that thing in there was crazy. Right. Yeah. 
uh, we were talking about uh, uh, you know the Munchkins racing and stuff like that, and you getting back in a cart seat. But as as we're talking about you okay ribs and stuff like that, some of the things that might hold you back a little bit from getting into the cart seat. Yeah, something just popped in my head. Aside from time, money, etc., what about uh, late models or, or oval racing? I mean, you talked about how much yeah. you love that business. And yeah, then- no, that would be awesome. That would be awesome. I mean, ultimately, it does for me come down to time and money because we are so invested with Rocky now. Right, it's so right, about right. him now, and I know that anything I would be doing in racing primarily would just be fun. It would be a money suck. I'd just be going to do it to do it. Right? Yeah. It's unlikely that it's going to at this point turn into a career for me. Right. Sure. It's just difficult for that to, to become a reality. So, um, you know, I think what, uh, would be fun. I mean, I do think a car for sure is a better program for me because yeah. I don't have to worry about the ribs. Right. I don't have to worry about the weight. Um, it's easier. It's e- ultimately it's easier on your body to mm-hmm. do. Um, and I had a blast like driving that GTP car a couple, couple, uh, summers ago was just amazing. It was, it was so freaking cool, but did you still feel pretty sharp behind the I wheel? did. Yeah, I nice. did. Yeah. I, I actually, um, I bumped into willpower, um, at a, at a vacation. My wife and I were on a vacation in Hawaii and we bumped into him. Uh, I was in my mid thirties and, and him and I are the same age and we ended up having dinner together and he was telling me ironically that Elio, he was teammates with Elio back then. Elio Castronavis was telling him that at 41 or 42, I think that's how old Elio was at the time back in 2015 or 16, um, felt the best he's ever felt in his life in an Indy car. And wow. he'd been racing for Penske for 20 years that like mentally, maybe physically he wasn't at his best, but mentally definitely was. And the overall mental advantage netted better results for him that yeah. he felt faster than he's ever been pretty and good a couple weekends ago exactly yeah exactly yeah. and then the guy <laughs> goes out and wins the indy 500 at 46 years old Jeez. so definitely inspiration for right? old guys like huge inspiration right. for old guys um <laughs> and so uh yeah it's funny because when i was in my 20s i always figured you know there's no way there's absolutely no way that like a 40 year old could ever be as fast as a 25 year old that just doesn't work like it's impossible and then, you know, I've looked at it now, um, you know, you look at what Michael Schumacher did when he got back into F1. I think he put it on the pole at Monaco at 43 years old. You look at what Elio just did the other day. Right. You look at how many guys in IndyCar now, the best guys are basically pushing 40 or that or, yeah. or close to 40 yeah. years old. So that that's 50 year old guy at, uh, at Loudoun at New Hampshire. Exactly. <laughs> that, that fat dude. Yeah. You know, <laughs> uh, yeah, th- they're out there. There's plenty of those those uh, guys out there. And I think the most important thing is currency. You got to be staying. You got to be staying in it. You got to be staying current. Um, you know, and and that's the hard part for me is I just have, I have so many, uh, so many things going on. I have three young kids. I have two two girls that play soccer. I have Rockies racing. I have my real estate business, and I feel like anytime I go racing, um, all that ends up happening is is I'm spending a lot of money to do something that ultimately is temporary. You know, there's yeah. not necessarily a light at the end of the tunnel. And I'm taking effort and focus off of other things that unfortunately are a little bit more important right now. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but trust me, if I won the, I actually was out to dinner uh, with my friends a few nights ago and my friends uh, are all, you know, non-racing people. They don't know anything about racing. They know I've mm-hmm. raced, but um, they don't know too much about it. You know, like, how do you explain what we do to, to normal <laughs> it's people? Tough. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, don't, right. you can't explain what we do to other people. They don't, they're like, oh, cool. You drive cars. Like, yeah. that's it. Like, yeah. yeah. R- Rob Niles, though, he put it as a, it's not exactly a water cooler sport. It's no, not exactly, yeah. Yeah. exactly, exactly. And one of my buddies asked me, he's like, so, and it was mainly because Elio won the Indy 500 and he saw that. He's like, so are you ever going to get back in? And, you know, what, you know, what's going on with, with all this? Like, would you do it again? Uh, and I, what I said to him was, look, you know whether you love something in a in a fake scenario if somebody told you hey you just won 100 million dollars a lotto right if you won 100 million dollars right now would you keep doing what you're doing whatever your job is right i love real estate at least i would tell people i love real estate uh if i won 100 million dollars i probably would not continue brokering buildings as much as i love it right. i wouldn't wake up tomorrow and be like i'm going to go meet clients and open up buildings right like that wouldn't be the first thing i would want to do if i had that money if i had 100 million dollars i would absolutely 100 percent go buy the best indy car ride i could i would hire a nutritionist i would be in the gym and i would absolutely absolutely do it but you know that's that's my my 
hundred million dollar fantasy. That's the only world. thing holding you right. back. That's the only yeah. thing holding me back. You know? <laughs> we need a, but, we need a, a Rocky so, Moran sponsor right here. All we yes. need is a hundred thousand or a hundred million dollars. Yes, yes. <laughs> so a hundred percent, my heart's still in it. I would love to do it. I still watch every IndyCar race, and um, and I, I deeply love it. I think about it all the time. But it's just the realities of life, yeah. you know. Is the is the kid gets older and he starts uh, he's gonna be moving into juniors here pretty quick. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's not he's not a big guy. Yeah. Uh, so maybe another year of cadets. Who knows? But yep. uh, and also going back to what you did in your levels moving up, not going up too quick. You know, making yes. sure you got it right. Um, where I'm going with all that is that it, there is a scenario where perhaps the two of you guys are in the same car. Not too yeah, far I bet, down the that, lane. That's yeah. crazy. I never thought about that. Um, I whether it be a Miata or endurance race yeah, or what have you. Yeah. Well, what's cool is he is going to move up next year, so he'll be in a full size car. Okay. Right. And so incentive. The, yeah. Theoretically, we could find a way to like uh, match up motors to where him and yes. I could go out and mess around on the car track together. Yeah, yeah. buddy. You know, with a, with kind of same size cart, same kind same kind of motors. And Actually, masters and juniors are supposed to be pretty close. They are close. Speed. That would be cool. Yeah. Almost the same fun. lap time with the weight difference and the restricted they have. Yeah. Yeah, because when I've done it before, it's like a lead follow, and his yeah. carts, you know, it doesn't work. Yeah. But now he could actually like race me, you know, which would be crazy. I've Ooh. never thought about racing him. That'd be so cool. Yeah. That's, that'd awesome. be so much fun. <laughs> I got to do that. Yeah. I've got to do that. We're gonna need that gonna million dollars. Tonight. I remember racing different. against father son duos. Matt Matt Johnson and his dad. They yeah, used to Mike, race. Yeah. yeah, they used to race together, and I'd be racing against both of them. Uh, I got just to share a track with that uh, with both of them at the same time in two oh six. It was mm-hmm. those two idiots running into each other. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was awesome. That's the best. That's Can you the imagine? Best. Uh, oh man, that'd be so fun for you, bud. Yeah, to exactly. run with the Munchkin. Yeah, that's a great point. That's Did you ever a get a chance point. to to wheel around with your dad? Um. No, we never were on the same racetrack He's at not the same a time. small cat. That's so, a problem for senior. Yeah. I mean, that actually hurt him in racing because he was 6'4", 220 in his yeah. prime when he was lean. And he's got like giant size hands, yeah. giant size bones. He is a big, big, way, way too big for karting. Yeah. Um. So I, he did at the first kart race I went to in 1990 or, or one of those. He was out there and he had a, he had a kart that Ron Emick had given him. And I remember watching him go through the sandbox and the go-kart was up at like two and a half feet in the air. Like it was bicycling over. Like it physically, the go-kart stopped working with his size in that era. So he was never able to even really kart. He did a few laps and ran raceway, but he was never able to um, like go race, ran raceway, which I'm sure he would have loved to have done. Um, And he really always belonged in a car. His best uh, opportunity in an Indy car came in his mid 40s. He had an opportunity to drive for Menard at the speedway, uh, Menard at the time had basically the fastest cars. His cars were on par with Penske cars. Mm-hmm. That year, they were faster than Penske cars. Wow. And and my dad had proven himself at the speedway. He had drove for AJ Foyt and done really well in older, older classifications of cars. And he actually got plugged into that ride, which would have been a ride he could have won the Indy 500 in. And that particular vintage of cars, I think it was a March, they were designed at that point for really small um, like you know European F1 guys so yeah. even the area around the knees his knees couldn't physically fit into that bulkhead area his oh, knees were, were rubbing into each other and, and smashed against the side of the tub it was unsafe and his head was sticking out of the car like six inches so they had to try to make up a custom windscreen for for him and ultimately he didn't get to do the race because he was too big he couldn't fit in the car oh wow man. so there really is a curse at a certain point if you're too big mm-hmm. um i think you know i'm on the up run of that limit but i can trim myself down to fake it and make it work yeah at his at his uh size you know there were certain cars definitely he couldn't fit in most of the the big cars he raced in he could fit in but you know, if you're racing Danica Patrick and she weighs 100 pounds and you're you happen to be a big dude and you're 200 pounds, <laughs> yeah, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to do the math on what yeah. that does to tire tire wear, fuel loads, yeah, uh, exactly. lap time in general, power Everything. to weight. It's just not good, you yeah. know. You guys so. would probably get get thing to get around qualifying, but over the course of a, a stint, yeah, yep. Did you have ever any uh, issues in the endurance stuff or the even the uh, you said you did ALMS, right? Yep. Yeah, with um, a shorter teammate or whatever. Yeah, so thankfully they normally will um they normally will put they'll build the seat around the biggest dude, mm-hmm. which is logical, it makes sense. And then the big the inserts. smaller guys will have inserts that plug yeah. into those seats. And so it always worked out pretty good. Uh and when I raced with PJ in two thousand eleven, ironically we're like the same build. So the the cockpit was great. Um I did have one race where I went to in two thousand six at Miller Motorsports Park. I think it's called Salt Lake 
Park or whatever it is now. I, I don't know the new name, but um, I went there and it was a one-off deal. I got called in late, um, like a lot of other races in my 20s and 30s. And the guy that was there was kind of a prima donna and he was yeah. a small little guy. And he's like, I'm not pouring another seat. You got to fit in my seat if you want to try this car. And I had like a, I don't know, like a size 35 waist and he had like a size 31 waist. And it, it just physically, I could, I was like breaking his seat to get into yeah. the car. And, um, it, he ended up finally backing off on it after like a big fight. And, um, it, it kind of dawned on me. It's a lot more fun to drive a car that's fitted for you because yeah. if you're driving a car, you're not comfortable in, especially for long endurance races. Oh yeah. It's brutal. You yeah. know, like there's a, there's a reason why race car drivers will go to a shop and spend a half a day or a full day getting fitted in a getting car. It right. Yeah. Get, yeah. get the, get the wheel, right. Get the shift lever, right. Get your seat, right. Get everything right. Trim it all down, retrim it, reshape it. And then when you're dialed in, you're not thinking about that stuff when you're racing, you right. can just focus on going exactly. fast, you know? Right. So I've always been a big fan of that. Um, and, and, and for the most part, most of the cars I drove, especially race cars, we were able to get it right. Yeah. Nice. I would think that would be kind of a pain in the butt. So for, for little guy, yeah, hopefully he stays small for his karting career. But if he starts to get big, let's get the same size as dad so we can go share it. Maybe do a 25 well, hour or something like that. We're going to have yeah. to get him on cigarettes or hormones <laughs> or something that stunts his growth. I'll do yeah. anything. Yeah, you know? yeah. I don't want him to be big. You know? Share what, a cigar what, together. Yeah, yeah. yeah what, whatever it takes. Uh, yeah, I mean, we'll see. DNA wise, most likely he will get big, you know, but you, but you never know. Uh, I think for for Rocky Jr., really, our objective is we're just having a good time. We're enjoying the ride, you know. Like awesome. it's, it's my dad, it's me, it's him. We get to travel together. We get to go go to restaurants at night and hang out. Um, you know, up to this point, he hasn't been the fastest kid, but he's knocking on the door of chasing those kids. So it's fun to have a driver like him who's smart, wants to learn, applies himself and is continually progressing and moving his way, you know, up the grid, the right direction. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so he's, he's really done a good job and, and we're just not in a rush and we're not expecting it to lead to IndyCar or stock car racing or, or whatever. We're not, we're right. not doing this because we're banking on him being a professional race car driver. We've been through all of this. We know how we've seen the movie. We know how it goes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if somehow that door opens up, fantastic. That'd be great. But we're really doing it because we love racing. Uh, we love doing it together. We love being at the racetrack. Um, and, and right now, you know, that vision probably goes through his junior. He's in fifth grade right now. It probably goes through junior high and high school. And after that, He'll probably, you know, he'll be into his girlfriend. You know, there'll be, yeah, there'll, yeah. There'll be yeah. other interest in his life, you know. And if he's uh, your size, maybe playing football. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You never know. We got him playing golf right now. So okay. it's there golf or go. racing. We've eliminated uh, all team sports, you know. It's just just, uh, just uh, golf or racing. So we'll see. Well, I'm looking forward to uh, to him moving up to juniors and then you getting Hunter TC cart and get a chance to share the track with you again, my friend. That and, would be the best. And, I, that will be on my bucket list of life for sure. It's gonna be but, it's gonna be a good time seeing you two guys out there and then again selfishly getting a chance to race with you and whatnot. And yeah, uh, again on the selfish side of things, thanks for coming out and, and hanging out yeah, with dude, us. This is this, so cool to hear your history, man. It's been yeah. a blast. Thank you for taking the time. Yeah. You guys were great. And I think a lot of people are uh, listening, getting a chance to hear about Moran from you and whatnot. And and, uh, you know, getting a chance to, to hear about some of that history is, is pretty damn cool. Oh, that's awesome, guys. Thank you for the time. Thanks Absolutely. for having me on.